Dearest friends, honorable teachers, and esteemed guests, on behalf of the Koch School FinTech Club, I'd like to welcome all of you to the second annual session of the Koch FinTech Forum. As we were holding our weekly discussions within the club, we have had the vision of providing all our students with a platform in which they could expand their knowledge on the growing and influential field of financial technologies, while also gaining valuable insight from the pioneers in the fields of finance, economics, and information management systems. Therefore, with the help of this conference, we are aiming to emphasize the positive contribution of financial technologies to the economic and social development of our country through their allowance for financial inclusion in the society as a whole, and to create an opportunity for our students to get acquainted with these areas. FinTech or financial technologies has traditionally been used to describe all forms of new technologies that seek to improve and automate the delivery and use of financial services. At its core, FinTech is utilized to help companies, business owners, and consumers better, cons better manage their financial operations, processes, and lives by utilizing specialized software and algorithms that are used on computers and increasingly smartphones. When the field of fintech emerged in the 21st century, the term was initially applied to technology, technology employed at the back-end systems of established financial institutions. Since then, however, there has been a shift to more consumer-oriented services and therefore a more consumer-oriented definition. Fintech has thus expanded to include any technological innovation in and automation of the financial sector including adv advances in financial literacy, advice and education, as well as streamlining of wealth management, lending and borrowing, retail banking, fundraising, money transfers and payments, investment management, and more. Now I'll be yielding the floor to my co-president Khan so that he can deliver the developments uh, on financial technologies in our participating companies. As financial technologies have become an integral part of our society in the world of global finance, it is crucial that we became aware of their presence and how it is shaping our lives. Fortunately today, our guests and speakers are all experts in their respective field, which include banking, telecommunications, online retailing, and education. These sectors are heavily influenced by the progression made on technology. As we investigate such individual sectors through our forum, we will be able to see how particular companies and institutions have evolved and adapted to digitalization. Innovation is the law of tomorrow. Changes occurred in virtually all industries in the last two decades. And it is especially transforming the financial industry. Banks, which maintain their dominant position thanks, thanks to factors such as highly regulated environments are observing the emergence of new competitors that gain substantial market share. Perhaps the most surprising factor for traditional banking is the fact that these new financial competitors are innovating and growing in emerging countries like Turkey. With the rise of thousands of fintech startups, banks have to adapt and innovate not to lose their customers and to meet the demand of the changing society. While banks have advantages that fintechs lacks, such as more capital, greater knowledge of regulations, 
recognize brands and customer confidence, fintechs can bring new capabilities to banks, including agility, innovation, cost reduction, better user, user experience, and greater ability to use data. Today, our guest speakers are managing banks that are leading the fintech innovation in Turkey. FIBA Banka has chosen not to fight against emerging fintech startups, but rather to fund and give mentorship to them. Under the name of FIBERK, FIBA Banka has fostered new fintech ideas and developed them to lead the technological advancements in banking. In addition, FIBA Banka collaborates closely with Özgen University for research and development. Similar to FIBA Banka, Akbank has created its own innovation lab called Akbank Lab, working on areas like artificial intelligence, chatbot, and also collaborating with Ripple to use the blockchain technology on money transfer. Realizing the world is shifting towards user-friendly fintech, Akbank has invested $200 million to technology and innovation in 2019, which has enabled Akbank to win the World Best Digital Bank Award by Euromoney. In today's forum, we will also be able to hear how fintech has affected foreign-based multinational companies like Visa and Vodafone. Although both companies seem to be out of touch from each other sector-wise, both companies are continuing to invest in fintech. With the rise of COVID-19, traditional payment methods such as cash payments seem to be losing popularity among public and Visa, a company that emphasizes electronic payment has much more workload that they have to sort. When providing financial services to millions of customers, Visa has to, use to utilize every aspect of new technology. Although Vodafone is a telecommunications company, they also have to utilize financial technologies to create user-friendly and easy to access platform for their customers. Recently, Vodafone has made a deal with MasterPass to create a feature that allows card payments without contact. Likewise, Turkey's largest online retailer, Hepsi Brada, has to utilize FinTech to operate in a market that heavily invests in a new payment methods. Consumers are really reasonably affected by the convenience of payment and delivery. Therefore, providing best and most efficient fintech solution is essential for the company to attract customers. In order to progress the technological advancements in finance, students have to be educated according to the new demands of the globalized world. At that point, Koch University is the place to get a former, well-rounded education and a degree in finance or technology. Universities in the 21st century have to provide the necessary depth and opportunities for students to pave a new road to the next incoming FinTech innovation. Another educational center, FinTech Istanbul, is a re reliable, unorthodox news source, and I can testify for their reliability as I got help from their news source to prepare this speech. In just a few weeks, FinTech Istanbul provides a comprehensive education for people with courses like FinTech 101 and Blockchain 101. Thank you, Khan, for all these developments on our uh, guest speakers. In an effort to highlight the positive impact that FinTech places on our globalized societies, we have set this year's theme as the new normal of finance whose understanding plays a critical role in the economic and social development of our country amidst the COVID-19 outbreak. Over the past few months, almost all countries across the world have experienced various forms of remote work and distance learning and go as governments were coming to grips with COVID-19. Quarantine, lockdown, or social distancing measures, whatever you call it, countries have given this isolation different names but this, time, but this time was characterized by the same need to transform many businesses from retail to education. With the implementation of such measures, companies have been very vocal about the need and amount of digital transformation that they have to support their customers with. What was postponed or deemed impossible before was prioritized and executed. The more change we see, the harder it is to believe businesses will go back to how things were before this crisis. This no going back attitude 
is not coming from reality that COVID-19 will impact many in-person activities and spaces from open offices to travel and events. The desire to change is also the result of seeing the positive impact of digital transformation on various businesses. And this positive impact is what we will be using as our theme of various panels throughout this forum. The need to acquire new digital skills that better prepare the workforce for the future might have accelerated during COVID-19, but the writing has been on the wall for quite some time. Such a need to train and retrain affects the generation still in school, as well as the current workforce. Even before this pandemic, 70% of companies had a digital transformation in place or were working on one. But COVID-19 is forcing companies to speed up and implement new digital transformation initiatives. This is exactly why we have set our first panel's theme as fast forwarding digital transformation. Another important factor that cannot be disregarded in our new normal of global finance is the opportunities that fintechs provide. The post-crisis regulatory frameworks have been gradually set it, settling into place and financial institutions have been adjusting their business models accordingly. It is now becoming obvious that the accelerating pace of technological change is the most creative force and also the most destructive one in the financial services ecosystem today. In this forum, uh, with our panel reimagining the opportunities of financial technologies, we seek to capture the real, work the, the real world implications of these technological advances on the financial services industry and those who must supervise and use it. Before our panels, we decided, uh, we decided to invite a speaker that is not only one of the most influential figures in Turkey's financial world, but is also one of the most celebrated and trusted uh, public figures in Turkish history. Our, our guest needs no further introduction. Hüsnü Bey, you have the floor, sir. Hüsnü Bey, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, we, we cannot see you. Could you turn your uh, camera on? It's on. Khan, can you see Hüsnü Bey? No, not right now. Uh, maybe if you uh, reopen it. Yes, we can see you right now. So we'll yeah. be turning our cameras off so that all of our viewers can see Houston Bay right now. Thank you so much for participating, sir. Thank you. Ne diyor? Sesinizi varmış, görüntünüz yok. Aylan mı geldi? Kim? Aylan. Aylan. Aylan. Şu an geldi. Geldi nerede? Bütün ekranda olacaktım. Sesim geliyor mu acaba? Yes. Hello. Daha bize şimdi şuna basalım. Sesim geliyor mu? Geliyor Üstü Bey. Görüntüm? Yes. Ha. Şimdi geldi galiba değil mi? Yes. 
Başlayabilir miyim? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I think since you are responding to to me in English, you expect me to speak in English today. Is that correct? Uh, we we have planned the entire thing in English, yes, but we, it was informed on all the <laughs> communications. <laughs> but it, whatever you feel, whatever way you feel. Uh, it's not a matter of feeling, you know, because there was nothing, excuse me, there was nothing in the uh, your correspondence with me that mentioned the language. So uh, uh, I hope that you have uh, simultaneous translations somewhere along the line. And I hope that we don't have too many international students at Koch uh, Lisesi, because I have to speak. I mean, I prepared my speech in Turkish. I can deliver it in English also, but I have to, I have to translate as I go along. So no it's fine. Türkçe konuşabilirsiniz Hüsnü Bey önemli değil. Thank you. Çok teşekkür ederiz. Sevgili öğrenciler. Siz gençlerin finansal teknolojilerdeki gelişmelere takip etmeniz beni çok sevindiriyor. Çünkü bugün finans dünyasındaki gelişmeleri takip etmeyen gençlerin bırakın iş hayatında başarılı bir yönetici olmasını ev ekonomisini dahi başarılı yönetmesi mümkün değildir. Bu yetkinliğin temelleri üniversite öncesi dönemde atılması gerekir. Çünkü bu ilginizin devam etmesi halinde hangi üniversitede, hangi programı seçeceğinize daha etkili bir biçimde karar verebilirsiniz. Zira bu gelişmeleri ayak uyduran ve uyduramayan üniversiteler var. Hepinizin de bildiği gibi finans dünyası bilhassa son 5-10 yıldır hızlı bir dönüşümden geçiyor. İlk ciddi yerini şube dışı bir kanal olması nedeniyle alternatif dağıtım kanalları içinde ATM ve call center ile birlikte alan internet bankacılığı son dönemde artık en önemli kanal oldu. Bugün hepimizin fintech olarak adlandırdığı teknolojiliğin Bankacılıktaki rolü de bu süreçte ciddi olarak evrimleşti. Fintech 1.0 diyeceğimiz dönemde sadece banka altyapısı olarak teknoloji konuşuluyordu. Fintech 2.0 ise bazı bankacılık ürünlerinin ve kanallarının dijitalleştirilmesi hakkındaydı. Ama buradan sonra değişim çok hızlandı. Tüketici istediği anda, istediği yerde ve kişileştirilmiş hizmet talebi arttı. Teknoloji tarafında mobil uygulamalar, bulut teknolojileri, bağlantılar ve yapay zeka ile kabiliyet ve imkanlar çok arttı. Kamu ise el fatura gibi uygulamalar ile dijitalleşmeyi desteklerken açık bankacılık ve e-para gibi alt lisanslar ile finansal ürünlerin ve finansal kurumların çeşitlenmesinin önünü açmış oldu. Bu dönüşüme bankaların göreceli olarak yavaş tepki vermesi fintech 3.0 olarak adlandırdığımız finans startuplarını yıldızlaşmasını sağladı. Geleneksel bankacılığın sunduğu pek çok hizmeti tek boyutlu sunan inovasyon yaklaşımına sahip çevik çalışan müşteri odaklı ve tamamıyla dijital altyapıya sahip girişimler çok hızlı büyüyen bu girişimler bankacılık dünyasında yer alabilmek için mücadele veriyor. Son 10 yılda fintechlere 150 milyar dolardan fazla dünyada yatırım yapıldı. Bugün dünyada milyar dolar değerlem, değerlemeyi aşmış 67 fintech girişimi. Toplam piyasa değeri de 250 küsür milyar dolar tahmin ediliyor bu girişimlerin şu anda. Bu değeri de anlamak için toplam borsa İstanbul şirketleri toplam değerinden fazla olduğunu söylemem yeterlidir. 
Bir de bankaların fintech duruşu ve yönetim kurulu başkanı olduğum FIBA Banka'nın vizyonuna değinmek istiyorum. Çünkü bu gelişmeler karşısında bankaların duruşu çok önemli. Bankalarımızın bu genç girişimcilerimizi kendilerine rakip gördüklerini ve onlarla çalışmaya çekingen yaklaştıklarını görebiliyoruz. Ama doğru strateji bankaların hem kendilerini dijital değiştirmek için çalışmalı hem de dijital doğan bu fintech girişimleri ile işbirliği yapmalarıdır. Herkes kendi yetkinliğine odaklanmalı. Her şeyi kendim yapmalıyım. Her şey bankanın içinde olmalı. Yaklaşımı dönemi artık bitmiştir. Tüm yetenekleri ve yaratıcılığı şirketlerimizin bünyesine çekmemiz mümkün değildir. Dışarıda olan ve kurduğu girişimle ekonomiye katma değer yaratan bu fintech girişimleri ile birlikte çalışmalı ve onların gelişmelerine katkıda bulunmak için onlara yatırım yapmamız lazım. Şimdi size teknolojinin bana sunduğu en son imkanları kullanarak konuşmamı İngilizceye çeviriyorum. We can see that our banks see these young entrepreneurs as rivals and that they are timid to work with them. But the right strategy is that banks must both work to digitize themselves and collaborate with these digitally born fintech entrepreneurs. Everyone should focus on their own competence. We are transforming our entire organization and infrastructure in order to turn ourselves into a fully digital bank. And we have established our corporate venture capital company to work with fintechs based on the shortening of the financial iceberg. We have called this company Finberg. Apart from investment in Finberg, which is sort of a fintech shareholding company, we become customers of enterprises as much as possible. As Finberg, we work as a financial fintech holding company that invests in retail tech ventures outside of the fintech field and creates solutions by creating synergies among them. We have made four investments so far in the past year and a half. Pre-accounting software, e-money company, online payment system, automotive marketplace solution. And we will continue to do so because we trust our young entrepreneurs. I would like to inform you about our three initiatives. In our payment and electronic money company, Unified Payment Services Initiative, our turnover grew by 80% last year. With the number of customers served has exceeded 2 million. And the transaction volume through the system has approached 2 billion Turkish liras. Together allowing consumers to transfer money that simplifies life. On duty 724 transfer, which facilitates e-commerce shopping, interpersonal digital kapor. Where transfer wise, Turkey implemented solutions for international money transfer. Pre-accounting company in our account initiative the number of customers has increased two and a half times in the last year. On the other hand, we have started to offer solutions 
that provide benefits to SMEs, such as discounted fuel sales or check inquiry services. On the other hand, our company initiative, which facilitates banks and businesses to work together, started to support 13 banks in total. The number of transactions passing through increases five times each year. As the profit increased, its turnover grew approximately 10 times. We now provide our solution that facilitates transfer during the process, added benefit of instant credit future, which is the first in Turkey. What are we waiting for today in the world of FinTech as Fiba Banka? With the COVID-19 crisis we have experienced recently, it has had a tremendous positive impact on financial technologies. When we consider this, the number of FinTech initiatives will continue to increase. These initiatives, which have focused on payment in recent years, we now move to areas such as microcredit, innovative financial solutions, such as person-to-person -person and cybersecurity due to its increasing importance. On the other hand, solutions such as international money transfer and secure deposit systems that support e-export will come to the fore. On the technology side, I think artificial intelligence will create applications that are used by the masses. The priority of this will be savings management and support solutions to borrowing preferences. We can give examples of robo consultancy solutions for individual bank customers and SMEs who cannot benefit from the detailed services offered by private banking. New players called TechFin or Big Tech are entering the financial ecosystem after the FinTech initiatives. Who are they? Digital born and big initiatives that are in the daily life of consumers or businesses and have crowd. You can duplicate examples such as Amazon, Alibaba and Facebook. These players offer many products such as digital wallets, business loans, consumer loans, bill financing for their users. In addition to having serious customers numbers, they have more confidence than FinTech ventures because they have been involved in the trade for a long time. FinTech 4.0, which is the last period of the change we left with FinTech 3.0 above, will also be about these players. As banks, we must determine our position in these changing times. As FIBA Banca, we adopted the platform banking vision. We aim to grow together with our customers and business partners by opening our banking knowledge, license, and products. One of the most important concepts of the coming period will be the cooperation. This means that we can summarize in cooperation with the competition, will be the main strategy of the financial institutions, fintech and TechFin Triangle. The role of education, the biggest problem that awaits for us success in adaptation and strategies of this new change I mentioned is the workforce of the 21st century competencies. As Erzien University, we follow a strategy in three paragraphs I will mention. Since the first day, we have been trying to gain entrepreneurship innovation competences as compulsory course for all of our faculty independent students. Here we have established the first acceleration plant in Turkey. We launched an entrepreneurship undergraduate program 10 years ago, the first one in our country. We're happy to motivate 
other universities on entrepreneurship as well. On the other hand, we aimed to ensure that our students and lecturers are always in touch with the business world and concentrate on their needs. Our students learn all sectors and functions by practicing and working with the professionals who do these jobs in person. Finally, as a new term requirement, we are impl implementing new departments and programs. For example, our data science master program. We train professionals who will play the most critical role in the future of the entire business world to manage the data or entrepre new entrepreneurship for the fintech world. We have established research laboratories on topics such as artificial intelligence, cloud computing, and robotics that are at the center of the entire financial technology world. We work with companies such as ING Bank Turkey under the roof. ING Bank staff have actually organized a data science certificate program where 600 ING personnel have applied actually to take part in this program. I hope to motivate other universities in these activities as in entrepreneurship. We need this to make our country a regional power. Now, in closing, my advice to you is to understand the role of FinTech and focus on the value you can create in this ecosystem while listening to the valuable speakers in our program today. I sincerely congratulate the president of Coach High School FinTech Club, Demir Timurai, and all the FinTech management for organizing this forum and wish all of you healthy and successful life. Thank you. Thank you so much for your inspiring speech, Mr. Ozin. It's, it's an honor to have you here. And I believe all my friends can uh, share my feeling that it's, it was truly an honor to hear from such an influential leader in the world of finance. And we have had several questions through the YouTube chat. I will try to... Um, I will try to ask questions from different schools. Uh, if, if you please, we could uh, deliver the questions in the language that they were asked. They were mostly asked in English. Would you be comfortable with that? Okay. All right, so I'll try to answer, uh, I'll try to ask questions from different perspectives. And I've built sort of like a framework on the order that we can go through. So there are first, about two questions about your educational decisions and your educational background. So to start with, we have a question from our school, uh, from Mihriban Sude Toros, who's a senior at the coach school. Uh, it's about your educational background. She asks, before you built a successful business career after graduating from Robert College, you had your education in the US, both in your Oregon State University and Harvard for a master's degree. How important would you say was your education while building a successful business? And do you think you could be as successful without such an education? Well, obviously, education is very important in one's life. Uh, and I made my educational decisions actually not very formally. Uh, before, because when I graduated from Robert College I, I, Academy, I couldn't get a scholarship from any of the good schools. I mean, Georgia Tech, Columbia, all these good schools sent me very nice acceptance letters. But the last paragraph was very disappointing, stating that they could not offer me a scholarship. So I found a half a year scholarship from Oregon State. It was half a scholarship because they only provided me with a room and board in three different fraternities in three semesters. And I had to pay the tuition, but believe it or not, tuition was only $32 per semester. I mean, so uh, if somebody tells you inflation in the United States is only 1%, don't believe it. Because inflation in education, inflation in the United States is more like 6%. That $32 per semester fee now is $5,000 at Oregon State University. Then after Oregon State, uh, I, I graduated from uh, 
Oregon State barely. I mean, my GPA was in my senior year was down to 2.17 out of four. So you cannot I, academically, I was not a very successful student, and uh, because I was president of the student body of, of a school of 14,000 students. So I was traveling with the American football team over the weekend to different uh, games in our conference. So I decided in my senior year that I wanted to do something more flexible uh, than just becoming an engineer. Uh, and and I, my professor said, you should go to a business school. So I, as, as soon as I graduated, which was not normal, I mean, because business schools accept you after three or four years of business experience, I applied to Stanford and Harvard. And to my amazement, both of these schools accepted me. And, uh, but I had, you could apply differently you could, uh, to those schools in those years. Now you can only use the internet, but uh, in those years, you can actually send very private photographs, letters, everything in envelopes to support your application. So I put all, the, all these photographs with uh, Bobby Kennedy, who I invited to the campus and uh, driving in a convertible Cadillac uh, on the, at Oregon State campus together. So I, I try to beautify, let's say, <laughs> and improve my application as much as I could. And the Harvard Business School accepted me. And since I had gone to a school in the West undergraduate, I decided to go to business school on the east part of Turkey. And I believe that obviously my education uh, was very important for me because uh, Robert Academy was also very important. Uh, there was no coach lisesi at that time. Otherwise, I would have gone to coach lisesi. But, uh, you know, uh, Robert Academy, I mean, uh, as a boarding student was a tremendous experience. I was there for eight years from age 10 to age 18. Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, to sort of build on your previous answer, we have also uh, had a question from Terakki Tepe Öğren Schools. Uh, he's also a senior, Ergün Açıköz, and he stated that he was going to pursue his undergraduate degree in UC Berkeley this year. So he has a question about the choices that you can um, make uh, as an undergraduate student in the US. So he asks, during your studies in the United States, you were studying civil engineering as an undergraduate student. Uh, were you inclined to the finance as business, uh, finance and business field as an undergraduate student? And uh, to, to, uh, for suggestions, would you recommend business majors alongside with your intended STEM majors for entrepreneurial purposes? Uh, these days, I would recommend industrial engineering with business because industrial engineering is the best way one can uh, receive a, a university degree because most of our uh, courses in, uh, at Özgün University re relating to AI, data science, so on and so forth, are all clustered under industrial engineering. So, uh, and I believe that the future is uh, what your FinTech club is pursuing, really. If you want to, if you want, in, in any business that uh, you're in, uh, digitization uh, is the key in every business that you can pursue. So I would recommend industrial engineering I mean, if you don't want to, if you if you don't want to become a doctor or a lawyer, you know, uh, industrial engineering or, uh, of course, uh, com computer engineering, computer science, uh, yeah, electronics engineering. These are very important uh, academic degrees. Thank you so much. So now I think we could move on to your decisions uh, as in your finance career. Uh, we have a question from Ankara from uh, Bilkent Laboratory International Schools, Onur from Onur Khan Shekerev. He's asking, uh, what was your uh, mindset when deciding to start to initiate Finance Bank when you had a secure job at Pamuk Bank? And also after your successes, 
uh, there are, he states that there are many hardworking and smart entrepreneurs in the world that you have met. What do you think differentiates successful entrepreneurs from unsuccessful ones? Well, obviously successful entrepreneurs do not have common traits. You know, they're quite all, they're all different and you have to be different from each other to be a successful uh, entrepreneur or a businessman. So uh, I believe that the reason, first of all, that I established Finansman was to basically own a small bank because I didn't leave Pamuk Bank. I left Yapu Kredi. I was managing director of Yapu Kredi after Pamuk Bank for three and a half years. And I, I turned that bank around and I asked for one person share of Yapu Kredi Bank from my boss. He wouldn't give it to me. And I decided to found my own bank. As soon as the news, one of the newspapers, Milliet, announced that I was founding a bank, my ex-boss called me, he said, do you want to be 50-50 in your new bank? I said, look, I own 100%. Why should I give 50% to you? You know, you didn't give 1% of your shares. Anyway, uh, so the, uh, the reason why I founded the bank was that I knew that I was going to be successful with a small bank. I never dreamt that one day the value of Finance Bank would exceed the value of Yop Credit Bank, which it did in the stock exchange. When Finance Bank reached about $5 billion, it was a few hundred million dollars worth more than Yop Credit. I mean, this was a miracle, you know, because these things don't happen. I mean, Yop Credit Bank was founded in 1944. Finance Bank was founded in 1987. So, uh, and, and, and the age of a bank is very important in, in creating value. So uh, I, th I thought of having a bank with four branches doing corporate banking. And I had a tremendous confidence in myself in terms of the corporate customers I could bring to the bank immediately from day one, which is exactly what happened. But obviously after the 2001 crisis, uh, when uh, we saw that the inflation in Turkey was coming down and, and retail credits became possible with lower interest rates because of lower inflation. This created a tremendous uh, value chain for banks because retail banking is the key to uh, valuable banks, not corporate banking. The question, there, was, there were multiple questions, so what was the last yes, one? Yes, and um, I think you, you answered them all. It, it was sort of like they were linked to each other. So um, we, there, there has been a question from Robert College. Selin Kumru is asking the question. Uh, so obviously we know you as a very successful person. Everybody uh, is aware of your successes, but she's asking in your career, have there been any experiences where failures have derived successes? If so, if you could elaborate on one. Well, I have had several failures and I think uh, I was the first one that uh, we actually had a, uh, had a meeting of, uh, to discuss our failures. Ali Sabanje, Emre Kurtepeli from the internet world and myself, we attended this and uh, it's on the YouTube so she can watch it there. <laughs> you know, in other words, uh, you, you see, in, if you go to Silicon Valley and ask for uh, money, you know, for your business, venture capital, they first ask you, which businesses have you failed? If you haven't failed any businesses, they don't give you money. Because they don't want you to, to fail with their money, <laughs> you know. <laughs> failure is a very important experience as long as you you know how to learn from that one of the one of the smaller failures i had was i said look i have a university it's quite a successful university considering it's only 12 years old i said i'd like to, why don't i teach english to the russians so i went and got the uh, wall street institute franchise 
from the you know private equity firm Carlyle. They gave me all of Russia, and uh, they were already active in China, but Russian franchise were was available. So we opened about four centers in Moscow, and we built up the business to some 3,000 students or so, but it never made any money. I mean, the five years, we lost money every month, even though we had a pretty successful operation. And finally, I said, you know, we got to sell this to my son, Murat. He said, because if you don't sell a money losing business, uh, it's very frustrating. So finally, we had a gentleman from Israel that came to us and he did, he did due diligence. And he said, look, I'll buy this business from you only if you put 1.750 million dollars, 1 million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars into the company before you sell it to me. In other words, it's the only company that I sold and paid money when I was selling it instead of receiving money. <laughs> Surely an interesting experience there. <laughs> Um, we, we have two quite similar questions from Hisar and uh, Alman Lisesi. Uh, Alper Kınacı from Alman Lisesi and Duru Sipahiler or Sipahiler from Hisar uh, would like to ask about your experience of founding or initiating Özgür University. Uh, they believe that you, you have founded the university after that you founded other financial institutions. How did you come up with the idea of starting uh, a university? And also, Duru states that uh, no other companies bear your surname other than the university. So could you explain the reason behind that as well, please? Uh, these are obviously very good questions. Uh, I enjoy very much talking about Özgün University. I wanted, first of all, I felt that I, I was involved in many educational endeavors before Özgün University but all of them were in the form of building schools, girls' dormitories in Anatolia, being on the board of Hisar Foundation and uh, founding Hisar School uh, with Feyaz Berkert. He did 95% of the work, I did about 5%. But uh, I was involved in many, many educational, uh, my wife, of course, is involved in Achev uh, since 1993 that trained 1 million mother and early school children in Turkey, 1 million people. So uh, we have been involved in education uh, during our lifetime. But Özgün University was something different. After selling Finance Bank, I decided that I should build an educational institution where I could have a say so also in the quality of education rather than just building brick and mortar educational facilities and donating them to the, to the Ministry of Education. So after selling Finance Bank, I finally had the money to, to, to do this because I knew that this was going to take a lot of commitment. I also discussed with my family as well that uh, they would, my children would continue the pursuit of the Özgün University because a university is not only a lifetime pursuit, it, it will go on for generations. Harvard University today is 390 years old. We're only 12 years old. So, uh, and we also wanted to do something uh, for family legacy. In other words, we wanted our name to be inscribed on an institution uh, where First of all, that our grandchildren would also uh, make sure that they, they, they made, they, they, we had their commitments, so to speak, that they would uh, continue uh, with, with the quality of this uh, university. And so we agreed with the family and that's when we, I decided to do this. I'm very happy that I did it. And as, as I said, I wanted to take the responsibility, the full responsibility of the university and my children to take the full responsibility of the university. Uh, that's why we gave our surname to the university. 
Thank you so much. Uh, we have the questions about advices you have been given before having the chance to give advices yourself. So we had the question is from Notre Dame de Sion High School uh, from Beran Donmas. She's asking uh, during the early stages of your career, were there any who was some of the very influential people you have encountered and what was the best advice that they have ever given to you? And was that advice successful in your own experience? Oh, too many. I mean, uh, I actually took advice from people, but at the same time, at the end of the day, I did what I thought was right. And uh, that's how I decided to go to the United States when I was 17 and a half year old with basically uh, $1,000 in my pocket. And when I arrived at Oregon State University, I had $100 left. And uh, I started working immediately for a dollar five an hour. That was the minimum wage at that time. So, uh, but I consulted my professors, my friends, but then again, I basically did what I thought was right myself, you know, because for instance, a lot of the businessmen said, are you crazy? I mean, you are like an empire. You are the chairman of Yopo Gredi Bank. Why are you going and, you know, uh, investing in this new bank? You know, <laughs> nobody could believe it, you know. In fact, Meral Tamer, who was an important columnist in Jumriyet newspaper, came and visited me in Finance Bank when it was established. And he wrote an article, he said, I went to a building, but it didn't look like a bank. I don't even remember if there was even an elevator because I really started my bank on the seventh and eighth floor of an apartment building in 400 square meters of office space because I wanted to start with a low cost based operation because I had limited amount of money, you know. <laughs> We have had a few Turkish questions in the in the chat as well. Dilerseniz bunları size Türkçe sorabilirim. Türkçe bir iki soruya da cevap verebiliriz. Uğur Altıntaş sormuş. Bir dünya kurmak kitabında gençleşmenin ve yeni akılların bankacılık sistemindeki ilk entegrasyonunu sağlamıştınız. Bunu gerçekleştirirken nereden ilham aldınız? Best practice ve kazanımları ne oldu diye sormuş. Evet, bu çok önemli bir şey. Yani Türk bankacılık sektöründe çok uh, klasik bir takım uygulamalar vardı. Yani mülkiye mezunları, İstanbul İktisat Fakültesi mezunları bankacılık sektörüne önce bankalara müfettiş yardımcısı olarak girerlerdi. Sınav sonrası. Sonra müfettiş olurlardı. Sonra bir şubede ikinci müdür, müdür falan diye yukarı doğru giderlerdi. Ben burada çok bu klasik uygulamalardan farklı birçok şey yaptım. Çünkü kendim zaten hiç bankacılığı bilmiyordum. Yani işletme okudum ama yani benim patronum bana bir banka alıyoruz üstünü senin de işte yönetim kurulunda bulunacağız dediği zaman ben dedim ki ben hiç bankada çalışmadım. Daha Amerika'dan üç ay önce geldim İstanbul'a. Bir bankada hesabım da iyi yok dedim. O bana dedi ki ya ben de bilmiyorum bankacılık hakkında bir şey. Patronum İkimiz beraber öğreneceğiz dedi. Ya yani böyle başladık. Ben bankacılıkta şunu gördüm başlarken. Yani yönetim kurulu üyesi olarak başladım. Bankacılar içinde iyi yöneticiler yoktu. Ve ben bankacı yerine iyi yönetici almaya karar verdim. Ve bu iyi yöneticileri de o zaman Özgün Üniversitesi olmadığı için e, Boğaziçi ve Orta Doğu Üniversitesi'nden seçtim. Çünkü bu üniversiteler bilingual oldukları için ve de Türkiye'nin o zaman en iyi üniversiteleri olduğuna inandığım için oradan seçtim ve onları bankacı, beraber daha doğrusu onları bankacı yaptım demek istemiyorum beraber bankacı olduk diyeyim. Ve ondan sonra tabii ne kadar doğru bir şey yaptığımı seneler geçince anladım. Çünkü benim genel müdür yardımcılarımın hepsi Türkiye'de çok önemli bankacılar oldular. <gülüyor> Hatta bir de benden de daha önemli. Akın Öngör, genel müdür yardımcım. Hayatında bankacılık yapmamıştı Akın. Gitti Garanti Bankası'na genel müdür oldu. Vural Akışık, Türk Merchant Bank'e genel müdür oldu. 
Sonra Kemal Derviş onu Ziraat Bankası Genel Müdürü yaptı. İbrahim Betil Garanti Bankası'na hakkından önce genel müdür oldu. Yani hepsi ben buna e, Amerika'nın bir tane basket takımı vardı. Çok süper başarılı. Dream Team diyorlardı o basket takımına. Benim de bankacılıkta böyle bir Dream Team'im oldu. Ve onunla gurur duyuyorum ben. Çünkü tabii onlar da benden sonra birçok bankacı yetiştirdiler. Ve benim en çok gurur duyduğum şey dünyada nereye gitsem benim yetiştirdiğim e, bankacılar var. Bundan daha mutlu bir şey olamaz tabii. Çünkü insan yetiştirmek kadar keyifli bir iş yok. Ve tabii ben bunu eskiden bankalarda adam yetiştiriyordum. Şimdi tabii e, üniversiteden daha çok adam yetiştirme imkanım oluyor. Dolayısıyla onun için de çok mutluyum. E, mezunlarımızın başarıları beni çok gurur duyuyorum. Çok teşekkür ederiz. Birkaç insan yetiştirmekten bahsettiniz. İnsan yetiştirmenin ne kadar önemli olduğundan bahsettiniz. Tabii bunun bunu yapan en değerli eğitim kurumlarından bazıları da liselerimiz. Türkiye'deki şu anda önde gelen bir sürü lisemizden izleyicimiz var. Yavaş yavaş süremizin de sonuna gelirken bizim kendi müdür yardımcımız Ümit hocamız bir soru sormuş. Kapanış için. Ee, öğrencilere vereceğiniz ve e, hem öğrencilere hem de eğitimcilerimize vereceğiniz tavsiyeler açısından güzel olabileceğini düşünüyorum. Ee, Hüsnü Bey'in lise öğrencilerine tavsiyeleri ne olur? Lisedeki eğitim hayatımızı nasıl geçirmeliyiz olarak sormuş. Belki kendi lise e, deneyiminizden bahsedebilirsiniz. Dilerseniz eğitimcilere de öğretmenlerimize de burada bizleri izleyen tavsiye verebilirsiniz. Çok tamam. mutlu oluruz. Tabii. Ben bir kere lise eğitimcilerine Öğrencilerle onları sadece öğretmenleri, hocaları değil, aynı zamanda onların arkadaşları olmalarını tavsiye ediyorum. Bu söylediğim şey çok önemli. Çünkü öğrencileri motive etmenin e, önemli bir e, bacağı budur. Ben e, hocalara öğrencilerle tenis, basketbol oynamalarını takımlar halinde basketbol oynamalarını tavsiye ediyorum. Robert Kolej'de bunu çok yapardık. Hatta benim İngilizce hocam Mr. Schalfant Türkiye'de ilk Amerikalı basketbolcuydu. Fenerbahçe'de oynadı. Sonra beni de Fenerbahçe'ye götürdü. Beşiktaşlı olmama rağmen Fenerbahçe'de 3 sene basketbol oynadım. Ve komik bir duruma düşerim her sene. Çünkü Fenerbahçe kongre üyesiyim. Beşiktaş'ta kongre üyesi değilim. Ama yani Beşiktaş'tayım. Beşiktaş maçlarına gidiyorum. Bunu niye anlattım? Eğitim, yani hocalarla öğrencilerin birbirlerine güvenleri olması çok önemli. Arkadaş olmaları, hocaların abi olmaları. Öğrencilere de şunu söyleyeceğim. Bence bu sizin forumu izleyen öğrenciler şu anda doğru yoldalar. Öğrenciler ne kadar akademik hayatla beraber öğrenci kulüplerinde faaliyet gösterirlerse, spor yaparlarsa, e, müzik aleti çalarlarsa hayatı dolu dolu yaşarlarsa ilerideki hayatlarında o kadar başarılı olurlar. Ben yani Robert Kolej'de voleybol takımı kaptanıydım. Basketbol takımındaydım. Drama Club'daydım. Yani Julius Caesar rolünde Cassius. Julius Caesar şeyinde piyesinde Cassius rolünde oynadım. Sonra Stalag 17'de oynadım. Yani e, Tabii bu piyesler de aynı zamanda Arnavutköy Kız Koleji'nden kız arkadaşlarımız da oluyordu. Dolayısıyla o vesileyle Arnavutköy Kız Koleji'ne gidiyorduk. Onlar bizim kampusa geliyorlardı. Yani Drama Club güzel bir kulüptü. Yani şunu söylemek istiyorum. Hayatı dolu dolu yaşamak lazım. Ve de networking çok önemli. Networking. Yani it's not what you know it's who you know hala çok geçerli bir söz teşekkürler thank you I will be entertaining the last question that we just received from the chat I think this question is important because it's about human connections and uh, the importance of making connections so, and about your personality So which qualities of your personality do you believe have been useful in managing and communicating with people? 
how crucial do you think the art of persuasion is in business deals? Uh, this is a very important question. Uh, when I went to Harvard Business School, I, a second year course was mandatory. And the name of that course was uh, Human Behavior in Organizations. I had never worked in an organization before uh, because I just graduated from Oregon State and attended Harvard Business School. But I learned in later years in life that was probably one of the most important courses besides the classical courses like accounting, marketing, investment management, management and lending, so on and so forth. So uh, human relations is the most critical aspect in, in, uh, of life. And it's so critical for success in life because if you don't know how to treat people, then you don't know anything. All the technical knowledge, FinTech one, two, three, four means nothing. If you don't have good human relations, you have, to, in order to motivate people, first of all, they have to trust you. They have to look upon you. But by good human relations, I always say, I place more importance, not on how people, respect me, but how top management treat their drivers and the T-boy in the bank. I value this a lot. And whether they carry their attitude case themselves or have somebody carry it for them. So human relations are a very complicated matter. And it's, it's very difficult uh, to train people uh, in good human relations. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's extremely important and people have to spend a lot of time uh, trying to better themselves in human relations. Thank you so much for all the valuable insights that you have shared with us. I believe all, all people here, we have received lots and lots of thank you messages from, from your own Özgün University students. They stated uh, that they really value the education that they get there. We have, uh, we have our own coach graduates who are now studying uh, in the Özgün University. We have received thank you messages from them. Uh, so as we come to the end of this session, our general director, Murat Bey, wants to join and thank you for joining our forum. Murat Bey, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Can you hear uh, me? Yes, yes, you can speak, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Snerzein, for this valuable and inspiring speech. As I was listening to him, uh, what struck me, I found interesting, the human relations side of it, because uh, I think the schools are the places where we model and control or develop such skills and interaction, uh, unlike the other places in the earth. So that is uh, one side of it. The other side I'd like to add, uh, if you allow me to do, is the trust relationship among the people where we build in school, I think is extremely crucial because uh, schools are the places where we dedicate our resources and our minds to build such trust relationship among the students and between students, kids and adults. So I found it very valuable. Speaking from that perspective, I think as a coach school, we are very proud with uh, this panel, Coach FinTech Forum Organizing Committee for doing such a valuable gathering for all of us because we learn as we interact and we grow as we, uh, reflect our experiences. This speech was very reflective for all of us, I'm sure, because we got a glimpse of different things as we are listening, Mr. Snozin. For myself, I went back to first day in the United States, my own experiences, how I worked in cafeteria, and what I learned from different nationalities and different experiences. Uh, meanwhile, I think we are all in very crucial time and difficult 
rough and tough times with this pandemic and all the uh, difficulties in both finance and educational sectors. I think the best thing that we have is our own experiences, which is investing in learning and reflecting on our practices and our own history will lead us to overcome those difficulties. Uh, in short, I'd like to thank Mr. Usnoze in first and all the panelists, and of course, for the FinTech Organizing Committee, such a valuable organization, their time, their effort. I hope to get in face-to-face -face for the next one. I'm looking forward to see all our students and our participants, panelists in our next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Yusnave. Thank you. Uh, for all our participants, please do not leave us. The, the program continues. Our next session starts at quarter past, and it will, it will be the panel Fast Forwarding Digital Transformation, moderated by the journalist Hakan Çelik. And we're hosting Vodafone Turkey CEO Coleman Deegan, Hepsi Burada CEO Mr. Murat Emirda, and Koch University's President uh, Professor Umran Inan. Thank you so much. Uh, please, please stay with us. Demir, yes, I'm please. also looking forward to applications from participants of the Coach FinTech Forum to Özgen University. <laughs> Thank you. We'll, uh, then okay. we'll, we'll let your notes to them. My Thank last you pitch. <laughs> we got Thank it. you. Bye-bye.
I may never. Tamam. Şimdi duyabilirsiniz sanıyorum. Merhaba. Merhabalar. Nasılsınız? İyi misiniz? İyiyim siz. Kusura <gülüyor> bakmayın. Dün konuşamadık. Ben de size orası rahatsız etmek istemedim. Geç olduğu için. Yok yok. Rica, rica ederim. Merhaba değerli panelistlerimiz. Evet. Coleman Bey'i bekliyoruz şu anda. Sesiniz, görüntünüz birazdan gitmeye başlayacak ama sorun olacağını zannetmiyorum. Çeyrek geçe olarak belirtildi. Başlangıç saati. Kulağınızda <gülüyor> Coleman ve girdiğinde başlayabiliriz birazdan. <gülüyor> Görüntüde bir problem yok değil mi? Herkesin sesi görüntüsü iyi değil mi? Hocam evet, siz iyi hoş Hakan geldiniz. Bey. Merhaba, Merhaba Murat Bey. Merhabalar hocam nasılsınız iyi misiniz? Teşekkürler sağ olun. Merhaba Demir. Merhaba hocam nasılsınız? Ben de iyiyim ee, sağ olun. Buradan Türkçe olarak da değerli izleyicilerimize bir bilgi verelim bu panel için. Ee, arkadaşlar şu anda fark edersiniz zaten bu panelimizde canlı sohbet özelliğimiz. E, açık olmayacaktır. E, panelistlerimizin değerli ricası üzerine e, sohbetimizi bu panel için kapattık. Yorumlarınızı göndermeye çalışırsanız bize sohbet üzerinden gelemeyecektir. Fakat ben şu anda e, videonun description kısmında yani Koç Okulu COVID-19 salgınından sonraki dönemde diye gözüken yerin altında e-mail adresimi girdim. demir.timuray.gmail.com şeklinde. E, altında da bir CC'lenecek adres var. Bu ikisine dikkat ederek lütfen bize sorularını mail atabilirseniz panelimizin sonunda vakit kaldığı sürece sorularınıza yer vermeye çalışacağız. Çok teşekkür ederim. E, bu bilgilendirmeyi dikkate alırsanız sevinirim. Bu arada Demir çok teşekkürler. Sana da dün teşekkür edemedim. Ne demek Murat Bey? Çok çok teşekkürler katılımınız için. E şöyle planlıyorum, e tek tek yani bir soru, bir cevap şeklinde böyle daha hızlı ve tempolu olur diye düşündüm. E hocam, sizin için de uygunsa, Murat Bey sizin evet, için de uygunsa. Böyle bir soru soracağım. Hoca, hocamla başlamayı düşünüyorum, e, Ümran Hoca ile. Bir soru, bir cevap yapacağım. Sonra e, şey, e, Coleman'a sormak istiyorum. Sonra Murat Bey size sormak istiyorum. Böyle birer soru, birer cevap e, hızlı hızlı geçeriz e, diye düşünüyorum. Böyle arada bir birbirimizi kesip katılabiliriz. Birbirimize sorular da sorabiliriz. Sizler için de uygun olursa eğer. Tabii. I, I just called Mr. Deegan. He's, he's joining right now. Okay. Thank you. En son bölümde Elif Hanım bazı şeyler söyleyecek demiştiniz değil mi? O değişmedi değil mi? Timur Doğrudur. E, lise Bey. müdürümüz Elif Hanım katılacak. En sonunda tamam. bir teşekkür konuşması yapacak sizlere. Elif Hanım'ın soyadı neydi acaba? E, Doktor Elif Kara Öztürk. <gülüyor> yes, we have Coleman as well. Uh, so... Thank you to all our viewers who are still here. We have had a great introduction. We've had a great opening speech from Hüsnü Bey. And we are now uh, continuing without a break with our um, first panel entitled Fast Forwarding Digital Transformation. We have our valuable guests here. I'll just shortly introduce them and then yield the floor to Hakan Bey. We have Mr. Hakan Çelik, who is moderating our session here. Uh, you, you may follow him from uh, CNN Türk programs, uh, from his POSTA newspaper column and uh, TRT Radio. We have the uh, president of Koç University, Professor Umran Inan. We have uh, the CEO of Hepsi uh, Burada, Mr. Murat Emirda, 
and the CEO of Waterphone Turkey, Coleman Deegan. Thank you so much for your participation. Uh, we, we are extremely honored to have you here at our panel. Now I'll be yielding the floor to Hakan Bey. You can continue uh, with your panel. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much again. And the, it was really nice to follow the previous panel and the conversation uh, with Mr. Hüsnü Özgün. He has, uh, and he has an, like, a great experience in uh, financial technologies and the, and the banking system. It was very, uh, really fruitful uh, conversation. Uh, thank you and congratulations. Uh, hi again, dear uh, students, uh, esteemed uh, guests, uh, you are all uh, welcome to our uh, first panel today. Uh, I'm very glad to be with you and I greet you all with uh, respect. Uh, first of all, uh, again, I would like to congratulate Demir Timuray and our uh, uh, dear students. Uh, we had, uh, they had organized also fruitful and very nice panel in, in Koch School uh, last year. I uh, enjoyed uh, very much. And today uh, we will talk with three uh, distinguished panelists uh, and we will talk and we will discuss what happened in this uh, process with COVID-19 uh, headache. Uh, in this panel, we will uh, have about an hour uh, time. So I, I got some also uh, very important questions. I will ask my uh, personal questions to the, our uh, panelists. I also got uh, very important and nice questions from uh, students and our uh, distinguished audience. Uh, the subject of our panel in this panel, fast and the team of uh, our panel, fast forwarding digital transformation. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce our guests in this panel. Uh, Mr. Murat Emirda, uh, CEO of a uh, very important and successful company. I also closely follow uh, their success in, in the market. Hepsi uh, Burada, uh, he is a CEO of Hepsi Burada.com, Hepsi Burada company. And uh, a dear friend and uh, another very important company, a worldwide uh, global success. Uh, also, they are very uh, successful in Turkey, Vodafone, uh, Vodafone Turkey. He's CEO of Vodafone Turkey. Coleman Digan. Hi, Coleman Digan. Hi, Hakan. Thank you so much. And uh, our distinguished uh, the professor, uh, uh, Mr. Umran Inan, the president of uh, Koç University. Uh, and we also had very nice conversations in my television programs at least two times. It's also uh, very nice for me to meet with this distinguished gentleman uh, all together. And uh, welcome to our panel again for all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And my first question uh, will be for Mr. Uh, uh, Umran Inan, Professor Umran Inan. Uh, Umran, how did the education change uh, during this uh, pandemic period? Uh, what are the opportunities, if there are, if you see some opportunities in, in this process, and the constraints? Could you please uh, some explain us about this subject, this issue? Thank you very much. First of all, I'm very pleased to be in a panel with you and to be with you and uh, Murat Bey and Coleman Bey. And thank you, Demir, for organizing this panel. Uh, yes, I think that education and, uh, and uh, university education in particular. Of course, uh, K through 12 education was also hit by a rock, but this was a big rock to be hit by. It came very suddenly. And within two weeks at Koch University, we were able to turn around and start teaching all of our 750 classes uh, in uh, online. And, uh, and more than 85% on real time online. So we were all absolutely surprised that the technology uh, to do this was already in place. And that uh, most of our faculty members were able to just turn around and do this. So it, it changed everything. Um, in the end, when, when the process continued, uh, online teaching, online exams, and other things that uh, lasted for weeks and months. But I think what happened 
was that um, a lot of people say, well, this showed the feasibility of online education. In my opinion, more than showing its feasibility, it, it illustrated its shortcomings, its tremendous shortcomings. I have always said that university education is an appointment between generations. It's nothing but an appointment, really. My, my generation as the professors comes to the appointment and the students, the people who are transitioning from 18 to 22 years of age, and some are older because they're PhD students and others, come to the appointment. And in that appointment, we learn and teach from one another. That is the essence of education. It's not really the material that we communicate in the recorded videos or online materials and such. So uh, in my opinion, uh, I preserve my opinion that I've held all the time that uh, mobile and online education will never replace university education face-to-face. -face. Uh, if a person has to take 40 classes to graduate with a bachelor's degree, uh, of those 40 classes, maybe three or four, or maybe at most four or five can be online, but the rest must be an on-campus experience, a face-to-face -face experience where people learn and teach uh, between generations. The generational appointment has to take place. So I think it's very interesting that uh, a lot of institutions now globally are transforming themselves to do this and that for the fall semester. Some are really delaying uh, going back to campuses until summer of 2021. Uh, others are toying around with the possibility of starting this fall. There's a huge chaos, a lot of it driven by financial concerns because these universities uh, globally, uh, huge financial giants were largely standing up and were very successful financially because of an influx of tuition paying foreign students, especially in the West, Australia, UK, um, Canada, United States, New Zealand. These places were, had universities that were fed by uh, tuition paying students that will now have great difficulty going. And, and, and I think there are opportunities uh, in that respect for places like Turkey. I think that a lot of people from our universities, our, our high schools, our best high schools also target going overseas. And that I think it is okay for them to go to the top tier schools. But I always said that it's not really uh, appropriate for them to go to the less tier schools because the education that they can get in the best universities in Turkey, both from the point of view of the uh, students that they rub elbows with, and the point of view of the instructors that they get teaching from uh, is not going to be a par. So basically uh, there will be a change in Turkey because of economic reasons, because of the utter chaos in the worldwide universities, there will be a change in Turkey there will be a change in other places. And uh, we will see and observe this transformation. But I think there are opportunities for uh, Turkish students to uh, consider more carefully staying in Turkey and getting education, both undergraduate and graduate education in Turkey in this environment. Uh, so we will all see what happens. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Inan, for this uh, useful and important uh, information that you shared with us. And uh, in these days, one of the most common uh, uh, words are lockdowns and normalization and what will happen in the near future. Nobody knows. It's difficult uh, to predict. The, the, the second question for um, Coleman Deegan, normalization, normals, what the new normal look like for, especially for companies, this is very important. And, and the new look, work life be like, what do you think? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Hakan Bey, and uh, welcome to uh, my guests as well. And, and thanks to Demir. It's a pleasure to be on uh, with uh, the coach, uh, 
uh, school and uh, all the students. Uh, real pleasure. Thank you. Um, I, if I said to you uh, I knew what the new normal is going to look like, I would be the biggest liar. Um, uh, either that or uh, very, very lucky or very, very unfortunate to predict because in these days it's impossible to predict anything uh, with any certainty uh, for any period of time. So the, uh, the first uh, message is that from the business world, uh, things have changed from uh, multi-period, multi-year outlooks to very much uh, very short-term management and uh, trying to you know, um, uh, manage through a crisis because this uh, has been, uh, even by all statistical records, the biggest crisis that's happened uh, going back over 100 years uh, to the whole world. It's a global crisis uh, of uh, huge proportions. Uh, in saying all that, uh, there have been some big changes. If we uh, look at the last 11 weeks, uh, and I'll just give uh, our example at Vodafone, um, uh, to uh, Umran Hoja's point, I mean, we moved in a week uh, or a few weeks, uh, people, uh, we have in our Vodafone uh, ecosystem about 15,000 people working, uh, either with uh, ourselves directly or indirectly through contractors or call centers. And in that period, uh, and the majority of that work is office-based, we moved all that working to working from home. So uh, to give an example, uh, we would have 4,000 people uh, in our customer operations. Historically, they were, before the COVID, they were all working in uh, call centers or uh, fixed, op fixed office locations. They now all work remotely. So the, the first thing um, that will be clear, I think, in the new normal is that the way of working will change um, uh, because a big, uh, a big issue has been tackled, whether you would have the same productivity or the same level of output um, when people would work remotely or work in different locations, would there be uh, a lot of inefficiency because people can't talk to each other, have a coffee together, physically have meetings. In fact, what we've seen in the 12 uh, or so weeks is that productivity has been um, the same or even more um, uh, in that, over that period of time than we had pre previously. So this has uh, shaken a great myth, probably it was an unproven myth that you had to be all together in the same place to be a productive office environment. Maybe we're in a, in a pandemic Maybe uh, people are overachieving, uh, but I have to thank all our people, uh, all the people that have been working, and not just in Vodafone. I think I see it in, in commerce uh, all over, a uh, huge amount of effort, discretionary effort, uh, to continue to be productive um, in these days and keep uh, the economy moving. Uh, but that, I think, will be the biggest shift we will see, how uh, uh, work changes the, the nature of work um, if I just take Istanbul, uh, the average commute is one and a half to two hours every day. Um, this is a lot of time uh, which is spent on service buses or on uh, public transport. Uh, downtime, let's say, unproductive time. If you had that time to spend at home with your family, if you had that time to spend with your, on yourself, going taking exercise or going outside, uh, staying locally, that's a huge amount of uh, quality of life improvement. If you traveled less, drove uh, less, maybe it's better for the environment, less carbon emissions. So these are all things that maybe we're beginning to rethink about. Um, and a critical thing that will be at the core of all that is, okay, how do I maintain um, my productivity? How do I stay active? How do I stay connected? Uh, so technology will be a huge um, enabler of this. And what we've seen, um, probably if we had the same crisis five years ago, it would have been a, a much greater impact on productivity. Um, so the tools we're using, this platform, Zoom, um, many other ones, uh, they didn't exist or they didn't have a level of um, use, uh, ease of use or experience that would have led us to believe that you could have been um, active or, or productive. So really the technology, the speed at which technology has developed and will continue probably even faster to develop after this will make the quality of working from home easier. So the tools you will use, the uh, platforms, the uh, communications, the videos, 
they will become easier and easier to use. So probably from a work perspective, um, now there will be greater focus on this area. This will be an area that will become uh, more and more easier to do I mean, uh, and easier to, to see. So that's what we see. Um, and, on, and already a lot of companies and large companies uh, around the world in the IT, in the technology space are, are moving in to really uh, promote this way of uh, remote working. And when you balance it up, um, there will be uh, negatives for sure. Um, such as the lack of uh, human touch or your colleagues, your work colleagues. So we need to work through that because that will be a challenge. How do you keep that level of culture, that connected uh, nature to your brand, to your company? So we need to work on these ways. But these are smaller problems than, uh, than we, we would have had in terms, of, and in terms of maintaining productivity. So I'm sure they will be overcome. And the benefits uh, for society, for the environment, uh, for lots of uh, things, for productivity, for your companies, our companies can be, uh, will be a lot uh, greater. So that's how we see it in the new normal. Uh, how we get there, I can't say, or how uh, with any visibility, one month, six months, nine months. I think the, uh, what's clear is the, the, the, the cat is out of the bag in terms of home working as a as a broad concept, that's done. I think we're, we've crossed that line now. That barrier is is over and done with. Um, whether it'll be twenty percent, fifty percent, seventy percent, I don't know. Oman uh, said the same for education, but it will incontrovertibly, virtually change. Uh, we will work uh, more remotely. We will use technology to make our lives easier, to make our working lives easier. Uh, that's clear. So, uh, and we look forward to embracing that, of course. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, especially, I mean, uh, yes, we we learn, we we we get many, we learn many things about this pandemic, pandemic days. Especially, you underline the importance of the productivity, uh, as you mentioned. Especially if we live in Istanbul, such as huge city, we are spending too much time on on on, on the transportation, and I think we will individual. I mean, the person, people, and and also the companies will uh, mostly focus on the productivity and the time using it because we were spending too much time for maybe unnecessary and unproductive things. Also the companies uh, and the institutions uh, will learn many things about uh, in, in these days. My, thank you. Uh, my third question uh, for Mr. Emirda, and this question came from uh, our audience, from our st students, uh, they say, um, as we all know, the most companies suffered drastically from the pandemic. However, Hepsi Burada uh, seems to be one of the most uh, one of the companies that handled the situation the best. How do you think this uh, will profit your company in the long run, long term? And do you think uh, there will be any changes in the structure of of your company in the future because of the advantage? Uh, of your company has gained through the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 process, uh, Mr. Emirda. Thank you so much for the question. And I'm very happy to be here with all these bright minds at Coach School and distinguished speakers and panelists and guests like you yourself. And Thank special you. thanks to, of course, Demir. And in this case, yeah, it's a great question, but I feel like I need to start how we actually prepared for the pandemic situation because I feel like this digital transformation transformation happened actually faster than we expected due to this pandemic situation across the world and of course in Turkey. So uh, I can tell you guys how actually we got started for the preparation of this pandemic and I will take you next uh, where we are headed to. In the case of uh, ourselves, actually before even, even any case seen in Turkey, we looking at Asia and Europe, we actually took timely actions in our business preparation. So I can actually maybe summarize them underneath uh, under like three buckets. The first bucket was health and safety. Of course, health and safety for our customers, for our employees, and for our business partners. So we reviewed our entire value chain from that perspective and took all the necessary actions to ensure this is actually bulletproof. The second part was the business continuity. So we had to again, look back and understand the entire logistics, operations, supply chain, technology, in order to make sure we can serve nonstop 24 seven around the clock 
no matter what. So this was our another preparation action plan. The last but not least, we realize e-commerce and technology is going to play a key role during this transformation. So we realized we had to center social responsibility at the core of what we do. So the social responsibility we took very seriously. Uh, maybe you remember in the early stage, we started actually helping out the healthcare workers by providing donating uh, medical equipments like uh, masks, gloves. And then with the holy Ramadan time frame, there were so many families in need. So actually we initiated the national solidarity initiative together with the, in coordination with the Minister of Interior Affairs and we reached out 45,000 families in need thanks to our customers because they were also supporting via us to the families in need. And then we announced this employment initiative. We announced we are going to hire 5,000 incremental this year, by the end of this year, because we realized economy is also very crucial for sustainability. So all these actions, of course, taking care of small businesses, entrepreneurs, all these programs were another preparation part of our package. So honestly, we were well prepared uh, before this hit the Turkish market. And I think that was one of the advantages of the well head of care preparation. But then we realized the consumer patterns are actually, now we look back and see what happened. We understand the consumer patterns are actually kind of replicating the offline experience at their homes. So people, of course, in the early stage were looking for hygiene products, food products, and then they shift to spending quality time with family, like toys, hobbies, uh, family time, mm -hmm. building a small gym at home. And then eventually, like common set, productivity, like schooling from home, working from home, they had to build a new setup. So all these things happened, but then also we realized another change in consumer pattern, which is a new large audience joined e-commerce in our case, but also digital world. Uh, like relatively elder segments, also people who were not very open to digital transformation before, now they are part of this world. So all these things coming together, I feel like for at least near, foreseeable future, we will, we will see this digital transformation to remain. So as a company like us, uh, we were mm -hmm. well positioned to address the needs during these times because we could be easily, and we are the kind of the solution for people to stay home healthy and safe. And we know the responsibility of this. And that's why as an ecosystem now, we can operate to address that need around the clock, like I said, across Turkey. And actually, maybe people are not familiar with this, maybe I should also remind this, Hepsi Broda is very known for e-commerce platform, but it's also it's, a, it's an ecosystem. We have, a, we have our own logistics company, Hepsi Jet. We have our own payment solutions, Hepsi Pay. We have Hepsi Express, which delivers fresh grocery to your door within less than two hours. We have our operation center, so kind of we have all the systems and processes in place which we can help to actually people stay home or address their needs during these uh, tough times. So I feel like in general, uh, we should definitely keep our actions and measures as we already planned for. We should definitely make sure anyone who is experiencing digital transformation of e-commerce for the first time, we should handhold, do our best to make sure we onboard them with a very smooth experience. And on the next one, we should definitely never forget our social responsibility to make sure we are very key in this a uh, new world to make sure people can access services and goods uh, without any interruption. Yes, Mr. Emirda, I think this uh, COVID-19 process uh, might reshape uh, mostly traditional shopping centers because when people see the adv advantages of e-commerce, they are just because they also see it's it's also a safe. Uh, I think they, they, they also they think they will think to change their habits uh, to to visit uh, shopping malls as uh, Coleman mentioned that the time is uh, very valuable for our life in Istanbul conditions. If you want to go to a shopping mall, if you plan to shopping mall from uh, from a distance, so you have to spend the half of the day. Don't you think so? Yeah, honestly, the value proposition of e-commerce is very compelling. Like it's convenient, fast, very transparent. And actually uh, you always have peace of mind in a way. 
But on the other hand, we never see ourselves as a disruptor to industry. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, we see ourselves as a partner of offline world. So all these programs I briefly mentioned are very strong collaboration between offline world and ourselves. So because we believe as a retail industry, this can grow together hand in hand. So for instance, for instance, assume this, a vendor or a small business or retailer can now access anyone across Turkey, also not with our international platform to anyone around the world and can sell their goods or services um, right away. So it's kind of a big opportunity for business as well. But on the other hand, we also do a lot of collaborations like from one of the programs, now we partner with uh, United Brands Association to make sure all the retailers, the textile brands in Turkey, because they are very crucial for our success in the economy. So we help them out to make sure they continue their business during these shopping malls were closed and right, shut down. So we want to make sure offline and online works together because we can still make one plus one ten in this example. So this is actually our mentality. So it is going to be hand in hand together, complementing each other's uh, experiences mm -hmm. and making sure we build one solid end to end flawless consumer experience offline and online together. Yes. It's better to, to walk shoulder to shoulder. Uh, uh, yes, I, I understand what you mean. And uh, Umran, Umran, Mr. Umran Inan, my, uh, in, in, in our second round, I would like to, you mentioned a little bit in the first uh, phase, but I would like to ask again, especially this uh, aspect. Uh, what do you think about, uh, I mean, the, will be the first initiative you will be taking regarding the university once the pandemic is over, uh, Mr. Ina. For your, yes, your first yeah. steps. Thank you very much. First of all, I, I'd like to just comment on what uh, Coleman mentioned, the work from home. And, and uh, it really is a, a fantastic transformation. I think a lot of workplaces now will be thinking about keeping 30% or maybe 40% or 50% of their workforces at home uh, on an interchangeable basis. So not everybody stays at home all the time. And this will solve the traffic problem in Istanbul at the very least. And they will be more productive than they are now. Coleman is saying they are more productive now. But right now they are the kids in their homes. So the, if, if they didn't have the kids, they would be pro probably twice as much productive. So. I'm looking at that as a huge gain in my organization. Uh, at Koch University, we were able in early March to close our campus extremely rapidly. Within 48 hours, we basically emptied all the dorms, all the students, all 2,600 of them were able to go home and uh, be left on our campus in Rumeli Feneri. The only people are 140 families, faculty members and myself living on campus. And uh, administrative personnel and faculty members can come to their offices because they are our own people, but nobody else can enter the campus. So my first priority right now, coming to your question, how come they, uh, will be to open the research labs because Koch University is very much a research university of our 7,000 students, 600 of them are PhD students. We probably have 100 to 150 postdoctoral students. There's an enormous amount of research activity at our university, a lot of which is conducted in physically experimental laboratories, which are right now closed because uh, you know, we need to understand how best to bring um, more than one person to these locations and have them stay at social distances from each other uh, as they use the same uh, toilets, for example, and how they come and go, who cleans what and how. So we are now working on this. We have formed a return to campus task force uh, in, at the university at the very high level people and we are listening to a lot of people and trying to uh, come up with a roadmap of how we return back to the campus. Our summer semester will be online. So from the undergraduate teaching and graduate teaching, we don't have a huge urgency because summer semester goes until the end of July, but we would like to open the labs early in June. So we are working on 
plans and uh, rules and regulations, who takes responsibility where, uh, what happens if there is something. The biggest danger in universities and all universities around the world, and I'm following this very closely, is the dormitories. Because mm. if you bring, in my case, 2,600 students to the dormitories, they are staying in rooms of two people, three people, sometimes four people, and if very few of them are in single rooms. How do you keep social distance? I mean, these are young people from 18 to 22 years old. It's, it's, it'll be a huge disaster to try to manage this. So this, this will be also the underpinning of thinking about fall semester. All universities around the world are now thinking what will happen. I, I can't bring all my students to the campus. I can't. Even if they stay in the dorms and don't come to classes, I can't because in the dorms they are in danger because they are within more or less than uh, two meters of each other in the dorms. Plus they are young people, so they will never pay attention to what I say. So basically, <laughs> basically this is the hardest problem. So do you bring them to the campus or do you interchange them? Uh, one week come to campus, one week listen at home. Uh, how does this work? So uh, a lot of universities are now working on this. This will be uh, our task after we come back to the laboratories so research can continue because we now have 42 projects that my faculty and uh, students have come up with and are pursuing that are COVID related. They are looking at development of ventilators, development of drugs, development of vaccines, test kits, all kinds of high level and very high urgency research programs, in addition to all of our other research activities. You have to uh, realize that one third of all funding that comes to Turkey from all of Europe comes to Koç University. Koç University has an enormous number of research projects that are carried in our laboratories by very bright people. 600 of our students are PhD students. In fact, 100 of them are foreign students, uh, Iran, Pakistan, China, India, for example. So this research activity and how to conduct this in a safe environment is our biggest priority right now at Koch University. Yes, I understand. By the way, obviously you have uh, one of the best uh, locations and a nice, one of the nicest yeah. campuses in Turkey. I'm right. sure your, your students uh, want they to want come to come back. They want to come back and they want to continue face-to-face, -face, as you mentioned, face-to-face -face traditional uh, learning and teaching methods. Uh, I understand them very well, but uh, as you mentioned, you, you, you underlined the dangers of uh, the way they In fact, they, they, are not, they are not as comfortable in their homes in Anatolia and they want to come and be more comfortable in the dorms, but that, yes. I'm not comfortable. So that's, I, I, that's understand, I understand very well. And, yeah. and again, and another question for Coleman Deegan. What has the impact of the COVID-19 on the behaviors of, of uh, the consumers and the customers in this process? Uh, uh, well, and I think uh, you got a sense of that a little bit from Murat earlier um, in terms of what's happened. But I would say um, if I look at our own uh, business, uh, I mean, we have uh, over 23 million uh, mobile customers uh, all over Turkey in mobile and one million in fixed. So there is a, yeah. as a sort of a microcosm of, uh, of the whole uh, country. Uh, I think what, what we saw um, initially was uh, clearly a huge spike in usage. So uh, when people were trying to work out uh, with restrictions on social mobility uh, and uh, leaving their homes. So initially, people wanted to uh, talk more, use more internet, uh, maybe for uh, e-commerce purposes to shop. Uh, that was clear. Uh, so we saw about initially a 10% increase in or 15% increase in mobile traffic, but an even greater one on fixed line, so fixed internet. So the demand was unprecedented really, uh, double sales uh, in terms of new fixed line uh, additions in the first uh, four to six weeks of the pandemic. Because uh, again, as um, Umran Hoja said, people were at home, they needed to educate the uh, kids, needed to work, needed to get 
uh, connected, stay connected. And uh, from an entertainment point of view, uh, it, it is one of the few areas of entertainment, so gaming, uh, video uh, applications. These were, uh, this had grown very much uh, a lot higher. So we saw a, a huge uh, surge for the internet. That has sort of calmed down a little bit in the last, uh, or plateaued, I would say, in the last uh, few weeks, because we have now entered a, a different phase. The initial uh, shock uh, is over. People have, have modulated or moderated their behavior. Um, the, uh, on, that was on the, more on the consumer side. On the business side, what we've seen, clearly there is a, a big shock uh, to some sectors. So uh, if you're travel sector, um, the uh, tourism, hospitality, uh, c catering, this has been a big, uh, a big uh, shock. So we've we've had to work hard with our customers to uh, manage through this. Uh, I mean, the, the the good thing is, and you see this all over the world, the, the public policy reaction has been very strong, very fast, um, and this has helped probably uh, stop uh, a massive depression, economic depression. So, and the Turkish government clearly has made some. Um, uh, you know, efforts as well to support the economy, support workers who may be furloughed or out of work. So, uh, but this has led to some uncertainty uh, as we will recover. Uh, this would be the next question. How fast can we recover? How fast can economic activity come back, um, back to work, back to normal? So I would say um, uh, I, the way we look at it at Vodafone as, a, as, a, as an industry, as a company, we were resilient, but we're not immune. Uh, I mean, we've had um, you know, international travel has gone effectively to zero, as uh, that goes without saying, obviously. So some of our customers who would go normally go abroad are not going abroad. Some uh, tourists or foreign uh, travelers haven't come to Turkey. They would normally come. So that has an impact. Um, uh, but a, a greater impact, we will need to see how that unwinds or uh, rolls out in the coming uh, weeks and months. So that's why the next phase will probably shift from um, uh, just an all out you know, focus on the health, but also to the economic, uh, which is what you see with the public policy makers, governments, et cetera. How are we going to you know, ignite the economy, reignite the economy and demand in the economy without obviously putting a, a danger or a second wave uh, or a chronic second wave uh, in, the, in the months ahead. So these are the things that we're seeing in, a, in a consumer behaviors as well of how they're uh, reacting. Uh, I, I mean, uh, Murat mentioned it very well, I won't repeat, but the, a big shift from, uh, let's say, offline or retail to digital. Um, we've seen that with our business as well, from 20% to 50% type uh, activity from, you know, from people who would normally go to stores are now going online and, and transacting. And again, uh, I would agree uh, with Murat, this is not probably going to unwind because you know people you now will experience it always oh, a good experience i got the product uh, we hope uh, it, it came on time it was a, a good uh, a buying experience then they'll say right the next time i don't necessarily need to go to uh, whatever physical uh, outlet i can just uh, buy it online it'll come 24 hours i can return it there's a it's a so the, the build or the trust will will come in, in using uh, that behavior. So that is probably here to stay as well, like the working one. It was already here. Turkey is a very digitalized uh, market. It's a banking, uh, I've always said, has been one of the, the leaders in, uh, in the world, Turkish uh, retail banking market. So this will uh, move into other categories now, uh, which leads me to the other point about we need to help uh, business uh, businesses uh, to digitalize. Uh, we need to enable companies that were maybe had just one way of working uh, now they need to you know that these uh, social media or advertising platforms people that go there these will become more and more relevant to their business uh, how do i advertise how do i market my goods how do i deliver my goods these uh, so there will be a shift uh, because what became very obvious if you had only one way of doing business let's say retail that was uh, very much uh, compromised for uh, two months and it will gradually recover probably from June as the restrictions uh, unwind. But that's how we've seen it. Uh, I think we have uh, a few uh, nervous months ahead from uh, to see how the trends 
will come back in uh, in, in broadly. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying digital will continue to be strong, but how the rest of the economy, uh, and I agree with Murat, this isn't just either or, it's uh, everything, because uh, clearly for an economy to be very strong and robust, you need strong demand factors, which are very strong anyway in Turkey, but we need to probably have been dented a bit because of lack of confidence or mobility restrictions or uh, economic reasons. We need to see how that uh, recovers in the coming uh, weeks and months. Thank you so much. Uh, th there is a very good question uh, from one of our students. Uh, and the answer is very important for all of us, uh, for Mr. Emirda. Uh, due to the coronavirus, online shopping services such as Epsu Brother are becoming more popular by the minute, yes. But with the increase in the number of the online purchases, the risk of transferring the virus from a package also increases. Uh, what type of sanitary pr procedures on your products to decrease the possibility of spreading the virus through packaging? I think this is a very important question. Yeah, actually, I think uh, this is a very important question, uh, but I think I already addressed this because, uh, as I said, before even there was a case in Turkey, we actually revised our entire value chain. So any package that is accepted uh, to our operation center is getting uh, kind of all these sanitary uh, chemicals uh, actually taken care of. In terms of when they leave and exit the operational center, Again, we make sure it's all cleaned up or hygienically checking, uh, taken care of. And anyone who actually is operating in the system, of course, they always are need to comply with social distancing, all the masks, face uh, masks as well, with gloves, uh, routine cleaning uh, measurements. All these hygiene measurements already were taken before even that was a case. So honestly, we take it very seriously. And I feel like we were kind of a pioneer in setting the standards and norms. Uh, so to answer that question particularly, I would like, I would like to say, as Hepsi brought it, at least I can say it, we are very seriously taking this and we make sure every step of the value chain is actually definitely is com in compliance with the uh, Minister of Health and World Health Organization. And we definitely make sure all the actions are constantly checking, checked, taken care of. And we also make sure we are doing actually beyond the measures that were already implied. We always want to make sure we are at the top uh, end of the quality to ensure this trust. And also with our business partners, we try to do the same. We always educate them, train them, and also share all the best practices that we have with them so they can also apply the same systems, processes, and check and balances and get keeping processes that we already use. So we kind of use our two uh, heads. One is the actions we take, of course, we operate, and also the other ones that we can educate, train, and make sure we also share our best practices. Okay, thank you very much. Very useful answer. Uh, Mr. Umra Inan, uh, in a world that has drastically changed due to the coronavirus, what type of skills should students have in order to become successful? Yes, it is a very, very good question because the only certain thing in these times, uh, as mentioned also by my colleagues, uh, Coleman and Murat Bey, is uncertainty. Uh, the, everything is uncertain. I mean, I think even before the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, basically, if you, you ask me, what is the most successful uh, profession five years from now? I would never answer it. For the last 10 years, I've been telling students that the future is so uncertain that you should broaden your education. You should never specialize your education, broaden your education. So I think in some of our universities and in our educational systems in general, we try to sometimes make the mistake of teaching too much, teaching too much in a narrow area, rather than exposing the student to such a breadth of interdisciplinary areas that he or she is ready for almost anything in the future. So to this question, my answer would be that, I mean, a lot of people would say uh, data science, artificial intelligence, internet of things, robotics, and so on. But even at the time that we hear these things, uh, it's probably going to be past their time 10 years from now. So we, know, we don't really know. I think 
uh, people should, for example, I think the importance of liberal arts education comes up here. That many universities around the world, uh, people are exposed to the full breadth of the knowledge of humanity in their first year, and then they specialize in the future years uh, to the particular uh, major or discipline that they are going to be getting a diploma in. I think it's very important that we don't uh, we don't do depth, that we do breadth at this point. Uh, and I think that the curiosity, uh, curiosity-driven, inquisitive students uh, are going to be the most successful. I think that uh, uh, what happens when a human being is born on this planet, I think the dynamic range of interest and capability between people is huge. That's bigger than anything. So what schooling does very often is to channel and uh, grind the dynamic range to a more limited range as the students are forced to conform to, to the norms. I think educational systems should wind back and allow the student to pursue his or her interest in the most broadly possible way so that we can all, the society as a whole can benefit from it. So I don't want to tell students what will be the profession uh, 10 years from now or five years from now. I want them to pursue their own curiosity. People are going to be successful in doing things that they like most. If, if a person does what he or she likes, he will or she will be the most successful and therefore his or her benefit to the society and the world will be at the utmost. So what we should do really is have all of our children, all of young people uh, open up uh, the, the, the, the barriers in front of them so that they can pursue their curiosity to the fullest. Universities sometimes try to teach too much. I, I'm for teaching not too much. I'm for teaching the breadth and exposing the students to the full breadth. Uh, Mr. Inan, curiosity is a very important element for journalism as well. It is, yes. it is very important for, I think, every kind of profession. It was right. also the name of the rover of NASA. Yes. They were sent to uh, Mars uh, explorations, and you, you are closely following also these subjects. And uh, you and I talked about that in our last yeah, meeting. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes, yes, yes. And uh, uh, Coleman, uh, you you were also mentioning about gaming. This is important in the industry. Uh, also, this this is an also area. It's it's a growing, uh, and with it. We also see the mo mobile payment is growing related with gaming. What is the potential uh, here for you in this business? Well, Hakan Bey, I know you're a, you're a gamer uh, as well yourself. So there's a bit of, uh, you know, self-interest in this question, I think, which is fair. <laughs> <I think. laughs> or, or you have relations with very uh, strong gamers. I think uh, this is definitely what we've seen in the last 11 weeks. Uh, in fact, it's true. I mean, if you look at the major gaming platforms, they've seen a 60, 70 percent increase wow. in usage. Yeah. So it's not all about uh, uh, uh, Umran Hoja. You, I think you need to check your students. It's not all about studying online. I think they're, they're, yeah, they're all gaming. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, this is true. So uh, I would say two areas I think we will focus focus a lot more on um, with our technology going forward. Uh, one will be the area of uh, uh, TechFin, what we call the technology financing. So how we can uh, make the lives of our customers easy in terms of uh, affording things, because we will uh, move beyond just selling uh, uh, uh, gigabytes uh, and data um, and minutes. Uh, so as we develop uh, our our our customer products and services, we will branch more and more into areas uh, like um, marketplace. So for example, with uh, Morat and Hepsi Barada, we have a very good relationship where uh, through the Vodafone digital channels, we're uh, selling Hepsi Barada uh, products and services. And then 
we need to offer the customer an opportunity how to pay. If you want to pay by installment or you want to charge it on your bill, these will be uh, opportunities that will uh, that will increase um, as we go forward. So, developing uh, uh, systems and there, there, there are thankfully good regulations in this area, open bank, banking initiatives, which will provide the opportunity uh, for non-historical uh, banks uh, to uh, grow their, uh, broaden their reach uh, and develop the relationships with the customers. So this will be, uh, and you see in the technology world, lots of great, uh, cool uh, companies in the world. Uh, I don't want to name any of them to, for fear of leaving others out, but they're over, over the top services and they make huge um, they make huge uh, uh, simplistic ways of doing business and you know uh, having financial transactions and borrowing money or repaying money. So this will be a definite trend that uh, we will uh, develop more on. The second thing I would say around the gaming, to the point you said, I mean Turkey, um, uh, Turkey is a, a very uh, gaming centric market. Uh, we estimate there's over 30 million people who use gaming, mobile gaming in, in the country. So that's all over one in three, almost 40%. Um, and this goes from uh, Tavla, uh, Star, uh, if you play uh, the Baccarat or the, those games, to very sophisticated games. At the other end, uh, where, I mean, you know, one millisecond uh, makes the difference between your uh, survival or your... Uh, so uh, we, have, um, we have developed... Uh, uh, and this is very core to our business because clearly, uh, you know, the speed at which you can deliver uh, the signals or deliver the uh, the, the gaming uh, will be very, very critical to the success. So we, uh, and in Turkey, there are some great companies we're working with. Uh, I'll name one, Zula, is a fully uh, Turkish-owned uh, company, and they are uh, one of the leaders, the world leaders in, uh, in gaming. Uh, so we will see this developing more. Um, and as we move towards 5G, one of the strong um, attributes of 5G technology is what we call the latency, i.e. The, the speed at which you transmit signals across the internet um, uh, from the time you issue the command to the time uh, you get the response. And the, for gaming, as I said, latency and high-end gaming, advanced gaming, latency is very, very critical for that. So we will invest heavily in this area it's a it's a core part of our strategy when we as we advance our technologies uh, beyond 4.5g 5g this will become a bigger area and it's a huge market uh, uh, we, we reckon um, on a, even in advanced gaming some of the big platforms in in turkey there's two over 2 million users um, growing very fast as i said 60% uh, uh, through the pandemic so this is, will be uh, an area of focus uh, we want to bring. Uh, uh, it will become uh, even more realistic as you get into uh, artificial reality, uh, augmented reality. This will, the uh, gaming area will become definitely more and more um, suitable. And it's with a generation uh, now, uh, and some of the, most of the people probably uh, listening on this uh, uh, webinar meeting that have grown up with uh, technology and are very comfortable and very happy to use it and uh, actually expect higher and better performance. So uh, it's definitely something we will do and it'll be a growth area. Um, and I'm very pleased to say in this area, Turkey has some great companies and has some great minds and great commercial minds and great technical minds that are making great strides in the area of gaming. So we're very happy to support uh, support that and uh, give a, a good experience to everyone. Thank you so much. Mr. Emirda, I have two questions uh, for you. The first one, uh, what will be the uh, focus of brands for growth after the economic and social change process reshaped with COVID-19? Uh, I would like to know your predictions. This is the first one. Uh, you mentioned a little bit, but maybe you can add some more elements. And the second thing, uh, you are, uh, you say something, you have an approach uh, that blends the Silicon Valley and the Grand Bazaar culture, two different cultures. Uh, you say, as far as I know, you say Silicon Valley with meets a Grand Bazaar. Uh, you are using this terminology. What impact this, did this culture 
have at Hepsi Broda. Yeah, thank you so much. By the way, I am also a big gamer. So I'm an ex gaming veteran from Silicon Valley. So I really play a lot of games too. So I really uh, make sure we play one time together. Uh, with that said, actually, our, our motto is Silicon Valley meets Grand Bazaar. The, I'll start with that because, uh, as, as you maybe know, so I moved back to Turkey uh, as a CEO of FC Broda uh, almost 16 months ago. I was a board member prior to that, but I shifted from board seat to CEO's role because I saw this big potential that we have in Turkey and ahead of us. We can create the largest tech story from Turkey for the entire greater region. So in order to succeed that, we need to make sure we embrace our unique approach. And that is literally Silicon Valley meets Grand Bazaar. The Silicon Valley symbolizes like the, our focus on data, process, systems, and innovation. And we truly embrace that. The Grand Bazaar though is our culture, the cultural ties, understanding the local dynamics, handshake, eye to eye, business, all those things are actually the facts that we already embrace in our culture. So if we can successfully merge these two dynamics, I've, I believe, strongly believe that we can create the largest tech company in the entire region. That's why we also give our vision, like in the very mid to short term, actually, we believe we want to become the largest tech company and the platform that is actually east to uh, Germany, west to India. This is our actually um, vision. So we want to achieve that with this motto. Going back to consumers, honestly, our uh, focus in terms of our consumer dynamics is always making sure we deliver the best consumer experience. And of course, as we move ahead with this Corona, uh, post Corona time, we're going to understand the changing patterns better. But we don't definitely going to innovate, adapt, and again, iterate, adapt, and innovate. So it's going to be a continuous process. As the patterns change, we are going to change as well. But the key criteria here to make sure people have the best choices available. They have always the trust that they can trust us. They always can access any product, any service, regardless of any geographical boundaries. And we also want to make sure the entire process is not finished even if we deliver their goods to their door, it's never finished. Even afterwards, if there is a problem, if they want to change it, cancel it, anything, we want to make sure we are always there with them to make sure they never feel alone. And this system and service always with them throughout the entire journey. So these are actually motto. In terms of patterns, we see all the dynamics we discussed. I don't want to replicate, but the idea is always to make sure we give these customers in these changing environments, the safety and the comfort of staying home if they need to, and otherwise making sure they can access any goods, any products with full transparency and making sure they get the best choice uh, and they make the decision. And we are just there to help them. So these are system and other parts of our uh, ecosystem like fresh grocery delivery. We know it's going to, it's, even in the early stage of Corona, we realize there's a huge demand for that. So we're gonna still, we're gonna keep investing in those kind of new services we want to make sure we also create new digital and physical services as we actually move ahead. So basically, there's going to be uh, strengthening what we have already, making sure we adapt our experience to changing patterns. And last but not least, we're going to keep innovate to address uh, to emerging needs that customers will have. And of course, we do this not just in Turkey. Uh, another actually priority for us to address almost 1 billion customers that are within four hours flight distance from Istanbul. So you need to also make sure there are local dynamics in every single market. So we should also make sure how we prioritize and adjust to their local needs. Thank you very much for your answer. And we are about to finish. And now I would like to, uh, first I would like to thank you for all panelists. Very fruitful, very uh, nice uh, panel. And we learned many uh, important uh, elements, uh, points from the different perspectives. And I would like to invite now uh, Mrs. Elif uh, Kara Öztürk. Uh, she is the manager of Koch School, Koch uh, LCC, and she would like to share uh, her thoughts, uh, opinions, uh, and some maybe sort of closing remarks. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Although we have started the conference and we are at the end of our second session, I would like to welcome you as all, welcome you all as the high school principal of the Koch School. 
First of all, I am always truly impressed with my wonderful students who have worked tirelessly to organize this event, to make this happen, Demir and, uh, and other, um, one of my other students. We watched a delightful opening from Husnu Bey, and now we're now finishing this uh, first panel led by Hakan Bey. Thank you, Hakan Bey. And with the contributions of Murat Bey, Umran Bey, and Mr. Degan. As you all mentioned, we are experiencing very different times. And while we're having difficulties about getting used to the new way of the life, actually, and also gaining new habits, we're also growing ourselves in many aspects. Um, as a teacher, I am uh, teaching a lesson called IB, ITGS, uh, which is Information Technology in a Global Society. And I know some of uh, my students are also watching now. Um, we are discussing the impacts of technology in different uh, industries and areas, and uh, such as health, commerce, entertainment, environment, businesses, communication, and so on. We were uh, making discussions about the future of education, teleworking opportunities, uh, autonomous delivery systems, unmanned manufacturing companies, virtual visits, and the shift of communication uh, with different technologies and the use of AI, artificial intelligence in diagnosis. And uh, we were doing these discussions like kind of a futuristic discussion. And now they're all happening and they all happened in one week. Every company or most of the companies shifted uh, to that system because of this pandemic situation. Actually, I totally believe uh, our panelists that although the change has some implications, somehow negative implications that we sometimes do not enjoy um, in our lives, I believe that we will have such positive growth in all areas and industries, as you mentioned. And I think all the community will develop new skill sets that will uh, make the new normalization. And I believe like our, some of our panelists mentioned, whatever happens, health and safety will be our first priority in industries uh, for our community. So I would like to share my thanks to all our panelists for their valuable time and they have committed for this event. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And I wish you a success for the second panel. And, and, and the floor is for Mr. Demir Timur. I, I think we'll say something for the second thank, panel. Thank, thank you so you much. much. Uh, thank you to all our viewers who are still here. We have had committed viewers who have been watching this from start. Uh, please stay on touch for, for the next panel, which starts in 10 minutes. It, it starts at promptly half past. The panel will be moderated by uh, Mr. Ege Jansen, and we will be hosting uh, the CEO of Akbank, Mr. Akam Bimbashkil, the um, senior vice president of Visa responsible from, uh, from Southeast Europe, Ms. Berna Ulman, and uh, the co-founder of Fintech Istanbul, Professor Sedem Yazıcı. Please stay on touch. The, the panel's topic will be reimagining the opportunities of fintech. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Teşekkürler. Sağ olun. İyi günler. Teşekkürler.
Ee, merhaba değerli panelistlerimiz. Görüntü ve e, seslerinizi açabilirsiniz. Şu anda posteri aldık ekrandan. Bir Türkçe bilgilendirme yapacağım. Ondan sonra İngilizce birlikte devam ederiz. E, tüm izleyicilerimiz şu anda sohbetimizi tekrardan aktif hale getirdik. Sohbetiniz üzerinden izlere herhangi bir panelistimize sorularınızı iletebilirsiniz. E, şunu rica edeceğiz sizlerden. E, lütfen sorunuzun yanına... Hangi panelistimize e, iletmek istediğinizi belirtirseniz e, ona göre sesler birinden yankı yapıyor sevgili panelistlerimiz. YouTube YouTube linkimiz evet. aynı anda açık tutan var mı? O, o yüzden olabilir. Kapayabilirsek çok güzel olur. Demir videolarımızı açamıyoruz bir şekilde engellenmiş gözüküyor. E, Emrullah Bey çözebilir miyiz problemi? Berna Hanım videosunu açamıyormuş. Benimki de aynı şekilde. Şimdi olmuş anda, olabilir mi? Heh, şu anda çalışıyorum. Tamamdır. Tamam. Evet, benimki de tamamdır. Ege Bey sizin de sesiniz galiba kapalı. Ee, tamamdır. Ben tekrardan izleyicilerimize Türkçe bir hatırlatma yapayım. Sonra size vereceğim sözü Ege Bey. Ee, ar Merhaba arkadaşlar. Hala bizimle olduğunuz için çok teşekkür ederiz. Ee, şu anda chatimizi açtık. Sohbet kısmını. 
Oradan panelistlerimize sorularınızı Türkçe ya da İngilizce olarak iletebilirsiniz. Panel İngilizce gerçekleşecek fakat Türkçe iletmenize de hiçbir sorun yok. Biz gerekli ayarlamaları yapacağız. E, mesajınızın yanına hangi paneliste iletmek istediğinizi yazarsanız çok daha kolay olur bizim için. Eğer ortaya soruyorsanız, herkes herhangi birinin cevaplamasını e, dilerseniz kişi belirtmeyebilirsiniz. E, having said that, uh, welcome to our second panel. This, the, the theme of this panel will be fast forward. Uh, um, I stand corrected. The theme of this panel will be reimagining the opportunities of financial technologies. Up to this point, you have been introduced to the concept of fintechs and financial technologies. And with our first panel, we have seen how the outbreak of COVID-19 has impacted various uh, sectors, including retail, education, and telecommunications. Uh, with this panel, we are now aiming to deliver further insights on how particular financial institutions can um, use or apply financial technologies to present solutions to, to the modern globalized problems of the modern world. Uh, with that purpose, we have Mr. Ege Jansen as our moderator today, and we have our dearest guest, the CEO of Akbank, Mr. Hakan Bimbashkil, the uh, senior vice president of Visa responsible from Southeast Europe, Ms. Berna Önman, and the co-founder of Istanbul, uh, FinTech Istanbul and professor at Istanbul University, Professor Selim Yazıcı. Uh, having said that, I now yield the floor to our moderator, Mr. Jansen. Thank you to everyone for your contributions. You can ask your questions throughout the, the, the forum. We will be monitoring the chat closely. Thank you, everyone. Ege Bey, başlayabilirsiniz. Hey, sesim geliyor mu? Evet, geliyor. You, you may begin, Mr. Jansen. Okay. Good afternoon, young Turks, <laughs> all nationalities. You know, young Turk is an English idiom, uh, which is very beautiful, very positive. And it has Turk in it, you know, young Turks. I think it's one of the few idioms in English which refer to something good about Turks and Turkey. Well, a young, young Turk is a person who is young at heart, not necessarily young at age, but mostly, of course, they are young at age as well. A young Turk is a challenger. He challenges the establishment. He challenges the established rules of the game. So you are the young Turks. You're going to be the challengers. Well, as they say, you know, just do it. You can do it because you are a young Turk. In this session, we will talk about fintech, which is part of economic life. Actually, you have been listening about fintech. Economy is the medium which human beings live in it. Economics is the science of learning the economy. So this session is not about economics. It's about economy. You know, it's the medium. It's like the water for the fish, air for the mammals, for the birds. So we got to know something about this medium that we're in. When I first heard fintech, I said, this word has two syllables. Fin, fin, Finnish, the Finn people. And the tech is taekwondo. So fintech, <laughs> how Finns make taekwondo? <laughs> well, this is supposed to be a joke. You don't have to laugh. But you know, I always enjoy this fintech, you know. It's not third tech. FinTech. <laughs> Economy is one, but it has two sides, like a coin. One side is financial, the other side is the real economy. The FinTech is on the financial side. But don't forget, 
There is only one economy. There are not two economies. It's only the sides of it. There is one coin. It has two sides. One side is financial. The other side is real economy. That's industry, agriculture, services, so on and so forth. Well, uh, in this session, I will start with Professor Selim Yazıcı, and I will ask him to frame the discussions so we don't get lost on the way, and also give some content on it. Second speaker will be Ben Hanım. He has a very long title. Southeast America, was it Southeast Europe? Europe. <laughs> Europe, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Does it include Middle East, North Africa? <laughs> no, this is Europe, yeah. <laughs> Just Europe. So, very good. So, she will provide us the payment system, which is part of the finances. And last but not the least, uh, <clears throat> well, I will not mention the name of the bank he's heading, but everybody knows it. You know, advertisements are forbidden. <laughs> anyway, Hakan Bimbashkir, he will widen our horizon. So fly with THY. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Selim Bey, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Jensen, for this warm uh, introduction. Uh, but before I start, I would like to thank for the invitation. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, and I would like to congratulate uh, Coach FinTech Club members. I mean, those uh, young, uh, brilliant minds and uh, also Demir uh, for his uh, efforts with his friends. Um, I've been invited and gave speeches at many conferences, but it's my first time at a FinTech forum held by uh, high school students because uh, normally you don't think uh, of FinTech while you are a high school student, normally. Uh, I don't know what made them think of FinTech, but uh, I think uh, they're on the right way. Uh, that's very uh, pleasant for me. So uh, that's why this invitation is very uh, precious for me. Thank you again. Uh, regarding to uh, Mr. Johnson's question, um, uh, since my audience is uh, high school students, uh, let's try to keep it very simple. Uh, and uh, since uh, we'll talk about economy, as you mentioned, uh, I'll try to summarize uh, what money is, uh, the financial system, uh, problems in the system, and uh, solutions, uh, which are the fintech. Uh, before uh, I uh, make a short introduction to uh, the uh, definition of fintech. So uh, let me start by uh, the question with uh, what money is. I I'm sure uh, that uh, you all know what money is. Uh, it's a medium of uh, exchange uh, used in uh, transactions for goods and services, which are in the form of, uh, as we know, coins and banknotes. So um, there might be a question if uh, we can keep the money in electronic forms rather than uh, physical. I mean, uh, e-money or uh, digital money. So uh, the next question is about uh, what can we do uh, with the money? Uh, let me give you a daily life example. Um, you can either save your money or uh, spend the money. Uh, in each of those cases, there's an institution called banked, uh, bank. Uh, banks earn money from the uh, commission they get from the services they provided. Uh, as uh, Mr. Hakan will explain, uh, if you save money, uh, which means that uh, you have the capacity or potential to lend your money to ones uh, who need money, then you go to a bank, uh, which is a key player in the financial sector, and ask for them uh, to give your money to the ones uh, who need money. Uh, of course, uh, you expect a return, uh, which is called as interest. Uh, if you spend money, uh, then you are a consumer, uh, which means that you have a capacity to uh, need more money. Uh, in this case, you, bec uh, you become a um, borrower. Uh, then you go to a bank and ask them to borrow you some money. Uh, of course, the bank uh, gives lenders money to the ones who need it uh, with a rate, which includes uh, your uh, interest plus uh, their commission fees. 
Uh, but uh, before the bank lends you uh, money as a credit, uh, of course, it must be sure that the borrower will uh, pay the money back to the bank. So um, there is clearly a risk in that. So the bank should manage this risk, uh, which is called as risk management. Uh, banks calculate risk scores uh, and uh, depend on the uh, risk assessment, uh, they assign an uh, amount of money with an um, interest rate and uh, a payback period, which is the duration. Um, okay, now uh, we are on a, a basic uh, financial literacy. Uh, as you can understand, it's also associated with uh, risk, of course. So um, I will ask those uh, brilliant minds, the young ones. So uh, do you see a problem in the system or uh, simply is there a pain in the system? Uh, of course, uh, if you dig uh, more deeply, uh, there are many uh, problems in the system. Um, if you're a lender, uh, you may uh, not get the interest uh, rate you want, which is your uh, expectation. Uh, because as a lender, uh, you expect to earn uh, much. Um, on the other hand, if you are a borrower, uh, you cannot find uh, money for your exact needs, uh, which are the uh, amount, the rate, and the payback period, which are uh, very important uh, <laughs> for us. They're also uh, related with uh, risk management. Um, in the classical financial system, uh, we are all dependent on uh, the financial institutions. Um, if you see those pains in the system, uh, this means that the system is very um, open to uh, innovative solutions, which needs a little bit of uh, creativity. Uh, with the use of technology, uh, as you mentioned, uh, this is uh, fin and tech. Uh, with the use of technology, those creative minds put uh, new solutions with their entrepreneurial uh, mindsets. So. Uh, Regarding my uh, definition, uh, fintech is the use of technology uh, to enable people to reach financial services uh, democratically uh, with uh, creative solutions. So uh, you can think it as a, a digital transformation uh, or uh, restructure, uh, restructuring with uh, fast, um, flexible and uh, personalized solutions. Uh, I prefer to use democratiz uh, democratizing because um, uh, by democratizing uh, financial services, I mean uh, financial inclusion. Um, as a note, uh, only 30% of uh, world population have fully access to financial services, which is roughly uh, two and a half billion people can reach uh, those uh, financial services uh, directly and fully. Uh, then how about the other uh, let's say uh, 5 uh, billion people, they are unbanked or uh, underbanked or underserved, uh, which means that there are uh, huge uh, opportunities, uh, opportunities in the system. Um, in terms of technology, uh, smartphones are the tools uh, or the medium uh, that you can reach financial services. Uh, you can use it as an uh, electronic wallet where you can store your uh, money or spend money either from your bank account or from your uh, credit account. Uh, you can send or sometimes collect money from your friends and family uh, as well, or make uh, investment or manage your own money or etc. Uh, this is fundamental for uh, financial technologies. Um, if you ask which technologies are uh, accountable for financial technologies, um, of course, there are many technologies, but uh, I won't go all through them, but uh, I will just pick uh, two of them, which is uh, big data and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, big data, uh, you can say that it's not a technology, but uh, we don't know how to dig uh, big data uh, in the, uh, let's say, uh, 25 years ago. Uh, since it's the new oil uh, or the fuel of the system, uh, you have to collect data uh, ethically from uh, every possible source you can reach. Uh, of course, there are some regulations, which is called uh, KVKK in uh, Turkey. Uh, in, in this case, the data could be collected from uh, social media on the uh, young, uh, young guys' uh, uh, social media accounts, from 
their smartphones or from your uh, wearable devices like uh, the watches, the, uh, the watches that are uh, that we are wearing. Uh, if there is no data and uh, so there is no solution uh, for the system. Uh, the next one I mentioned was uh, artificial intelligence. Um, with the use of software, uh, you can dig your uh, big data and make uh, more um, accurate risk assessment. It's all about risk assessment, I can say, and provide the right solution to your uh, customers as well. Uh, the problem- Five minutes to go, Mr. Yes, Professor. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> uh, the problem with the classical system is that uh, we don't know how to dig uh, the system, the, the, the data, and we don't have the tools to reach, capture, and process those uh, data. But uh, with, the new, uh, with the help of the new technologies, uh, we have the capacity to do so and uh, create some uh, simple uh, and cheaper services to uh, everyone uh, democratically. That's why I, I choose to use uh, democratization of uh, financial services. Uh, on the other side, uh, there are some entrepreneurs. Uh, those are the ones uh, who sense the pain uh, in the system, think about the solution and try to solve it by putting some innovative and creative uh, products and services uh, with their uh, startups. So, uh, what are those uh, services? Uh, I'll give you an example from Turkey. Um, in Turkey, there are uh, more than uh, 300 fintech startups uh, operating uh, in different verticals, such as um, payments, uh, banking, uh, financing, insurance, personal finance, and etc. or uh, uh, digital assets. Uh, so uh, we have a huge uh, ecosystem in Turkey, uh, and they are all uh, producing uh, financial technology products, fintech products. So uh, I think uh, I have broadly mentioned your uh, question uh, with, with very simple uh, and understandable uh, from the perspective of those uh, young, brilliant uh, minds. Young Turks. Young Turks, yes, of course. <laughs> young Turks. Okay. Okay. We may come back to you again, but now, for the time being, the floor is for Bernana. Okay, Bernana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jansen. And hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be talking to all these young Turks, all these challenges, all these change makers that are uh, really gearing up uh, to embrace the opportunities. So it's very exciting. I was with with you all uh, last year in person, and it is just excite is exciting to be with you uh, all over Zoom as well, well, over uh, YouTube, let's say. So I would like to kind of talk about uh, COVID, the new environment that we found ourselves uh, recently, and uh, what it means uh, for FinTech, and especially in my case, in Paytech, like what, it, what does it mean from a Paytech perspective, and what uh, kind of, you know, what are the trends that in, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs you know, need to be aware of uh, in, in relation to, to, to this new context we found ourselves in? So first of all, uh, some really basics. Uh, what we have found uh, is travel-related spending has really gone down significantly. So payment products that touch on uh, travel has been impacted negatively, no surprise. Uh, few, uh, and when I say travel, I don't necessarily mean just airlines. I mean, hotels, you know, uh, car rentals, fuel and all of that. Uh, and also uh, restaurants. Uh, so that's one observation. Uh, the other one is contactless payments uh, have really accelerated across the world across the world you know even some of the uh, some of the environments where this has been a very long and painful process like even in the US we're seeing a big ramp up you know almost overnight in many many countries uh, in the space because you know consumers don't want to have a physical uh, touch point uh, with with the, uh, with the terminal and obviously, we're seeing a significant acceleration and behavior change in terms of e-commerce and online payments, and especially in food and drugs. 
So this is, you know, we also experience that as, uh, as consumers and that's uh, the trend generally speaking and across the world. So uh, we are seeing a significant opportunity. So if I go back to the point on contactless, we saw that governments and regulatory yeah. bodies even stepped in, in environments where contactless have uh, lagged. They kind of increased uh, the contactless limits. They more than doubled them overnight and the whole ecosystem had to adjust themselves and make sure that they provide such an experience to the consumers. Same thing happened in Turkey. It more than doubled almost overnight in Turkey. And that, and thankfully, we have a great infrastructure and we were able to provide it to the, to the cardholders. But what does that mean? That infrastructure is very important for us for the next, uh, the next uh, change that we have been really looking forward and that's mobile payments. So contactless payments is very much part of our lives, but mobile payments are not quite there. And I think there's a lot of opportunity in there uh, that can be, uh, that can be uh, tapped into. Uh, what we're seeing is we're also seeing this uh, contactless physical shopping experience. So online and uh, offline kind of uh, merging. We've seen uh, things like the Amazon Go experience where you just walk into a, a, a supermarket, pack up what you need to pack up, and then you leave. You don't even need to do a contactless transaction you just don't do a transaction it's very seamless so uh, those used to be very unique very one-off examples of, of this omni channel coming together and i think again in that space there's there's a, a lot of uh, opportunities to redesign consumers shopping experiences in physical spaces going beyond contactless going beyond uh, mobile to i mean mobile uh, from a from contactless mobile perspectives, kind of co combining mobile with eco. We're also seeing a change in consumer behaviors. So in Turkey, for example, in March and April, we saw 5 million cards that were used on online for the first time ever, 5 million cards. So this is, this is, this is major. This is, you know, very, very important. And this, this will not, go back to where it was after COVID uh, is, is over. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing is about loyalty programs. When we talk about loyalty programs, we tend to kind of think about, you know, programs, you know, uh, offers in restaurants, offers uh, in airlines and all of that. That's not really as interesting for the consumers anymore. So there is a space to, mm -hmm to provide different, uh, different uh, consumer propositions uh, from that angle uh, as well. And there's a lot of space for technology and geolocation and all of that coming together in that, in that space. We're also seeing new payment flows. And by that, uh, many governments around the world have been lagging either in terms of disbursements or in terms of acceptance. Uh, so whereby, you know, some, some taxes, some penalties, you have to pay with cash or some disbursements used to come in with checks or, you know, with in some countries or uh, even in cash, you know, with also, you know, the, the queues uh, when people uh, went to collect their, uh, to collect their um, you know, benefits. So what we're seeing is we're seeing governments to, to open up and provide <clears throat> a digital experience to their citizens in acceptance as well as in, uh, in terms of uh, card usage. So again, another, you know, another area where uh, there's got to be a lot of innovation happening uh, and, and another area where I would urge these young entrepreneurs uh, to look into. And uh, perhaps one thing, I mean, I would like to kind of get back to what uh, Selim Bey mentioned about democratization. So even, you know, so these are the, the new trends, but one, one fundamental uh, piece remains, and that is about uh, the 
uh, unbanked, still unbanked uh, is a huge, huge, you know, uh, population in, in the world for sure, but also in Turkey. And uh, so there is a lot of, you know, room for democratization uh, of reaching out to unbanked uh, through uh, fintech, uh, through innovation. And I think, uh, again, uh, we need to remember that there's a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to provide, to bring in a lot of good to the system and also a lot of, uh, you know, uh, very, you know, positive experience for the consumers as well. So with that, I guess I'll kind of stop here and uh, maybe we can take it, you know, take questions or so at the end, Mr. Johnson. Okay, why not? Now, Thank uh, you. Well, uh, Hakan Bey. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Yes. <laughs> Are banks becoming redundant? Shall we see banks in coming 20 years, 30 years? You're, you're having a bank, yes. but you're going to lose your job. <laughs> if there is no bank, there is no bank manager. <laughs> you, I, I don't know which bank used that shoe is either branchless or you are the branch. <laughs> this pandemic yes. has created a great experiment for all of us. By the way, are you at home or in the office? No, uh, I am in the office today, but uh, I have been, you know, going home and coming to the office. So uh, mm. I, I don't have to be in the office just to, you know, perform my function. Uh, so your your office looks quite homey. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the meeting rooms. <laughs> oh, good, very good. Okay, so will you keep your banks alive? <laughs> yes. Floor is uh, yours, sir. Yes, yes. Thank you. I, I think this is this is a very critical question. I guess uh, the, the, the banks uh, will uh, continue to exist, uh, uh, but how you do banking will probably you know, change a lot. I mean, it has been changing for the last uh, decade, but we will continue to change. And to, to answer your question perfectly, I think first of all, we have to understand our, our customers first. Uh, so I think this uh, customer uh, centricity is key uh, in every business and also in banking. So uh, when, when we look at our customers, when we observe their, their behavior, uh, I think uh, there is a fundamental change. I mean, not, not only recently, but th there was an evolution over the last, you know, so many years. So we, what we see in our customers, they would like to be, you know, as mobile as possible. Uh, they would like to use our services uh, whenever, wherever they want, 724. Uh, they would like to have our services as quickly as possible. So nobody has, has patience anymore. I mean, it, it, it has to be, you know, immediate. Uh, quality of service has to be, you know, much higher than, you know, what we used to have before. So customers are actually much more uh, demanding. And uh, everybody, of course, would, would like to have, you know, access to services with uh, minimum cost. So also efficiency and cost side is, uh, I guess, is, is, is very critical. And, and also, Switching from one institution to another is much easier today compared to the old days. So th that is what we have been, you know, observing. So that is very good, actually. I mean, that, that is very good because, uh, in a way, uh, uh, our customers are, are forcing us to be uh, much better uh, in every sense, in quality of service, technology usage, you know, uh, efficiency, cost cost-wise, you know, you, you, you name it. We have to be good. Otherwise, you know, losing your customers is, is, is much, much more easier today compared to the old days. I mean, please look at, I mean, it doesn't really have to be banking, but if you don't really shape your business, then you may not be there anymore. I mean, 
that there are you know many many examples please look at the top you know most valuable companies in the world today versus 10 years ago i mean it's a completely new list compared to what what we used to have before so therefore what i'm trying to say you know uh, this this customer focus is, is very key and and we, we we have to you know adopt ourselves so now our customers are using services like i don't know you know googles and amazons and you know you name it, uh, WhatsApps and so on. So that they more or less expect uh, similar services. You know, maybe you are a bank, but doesn't really matter. I mean, th th this is the lifestyle. Uh, th that is the lifestyle of your customer. And so somehow doesn't really make any difference whether it's a bank, whether you are a, you know, in a serious business or not, but you have to adapt yourself in into that lifestyle. So that's what we have been trying to do. Uh, but I get, I find myself a bit, you know, lucky because, you know, when you look at Turkey, I'm very happy with, you know, uh, uh, pop population, you know, uh, uh, the demographics in the country. It's a young country, smart penetration and so on. So therefore, there's a lot of room for us to, to innovate. And when we innovate, actually, uh, we find our customers adapt to our new services. So. Uh, Bernanum knows better than I do. I mean, Turkey has been for many, many years, has been a pilot site for many of the products in payment systems and so on. Why? I mean, because of the, you know, young nation, the smartphone penetration, technological, you know, advancements of the banks and so on. So I think that this, this, is, this is a great environment actually for, uh, to test uh, certain uh, financial uh, products. And, and, and Turkish banks are actually, I mean, uh, thank you for the you know, opening statement. You, you mentioned Young Turks, but banks are actually, yes, I mean, there, there are many old banks in the country, but th they are young in heart. So we have been actually trying to innovate ourselves. And uh, since the topic is more or less, you know, uh, fintechs, I just would like to, you know, make a couple of statements of, about, you know, fintechs as well. So there's always this question, you know, whether you know, fintechs are, you know, banks, competitors, and I mean, uh, I, I don't take it that way. I mean, uh, I, I'm so happy that, you know, fintechs uh, uh, exist in the world. And when I, when, I, when I look at the world, there are like, you know, six, 60 unicorns. Unicorns means, you know, uh, uh, companies, fintechs uh, with more than, you know, $1 billion, you know, valuation as of today. I mean, that's a major success, you know, 60 countries in the world today, uh, unicorns. So uh, I think uh, these fintechs and banks are somewhat, you know, complementary. So th there are lots of actually positive sides of, of, of, of fintechs. So uh, these people are uh, focusing on a usually a specific subject. It can be lending, it can be payments, it can be, some, it can be AI. Uh, but they, they ex excel themselves, they, say they, they become very good. They, they create a, you know, another type of uh, customer experience. So uh, this, this innovation is, is, is, is very valuable uh, for us. So on the other side, banks, yes, uh, we are also you know, uh, innovative uh, companies, uh, but we have some other strengths as well. I mean, we have the you know, capital, we have the trust, we have the brand, we have the customers and so on. And I think, you know, fintechs and banks, when they come together, I think uh, we can create a lot of, you know, synergy. And we have been doing this over the last, you know, so many years. So we have, you know, fintech partners all over the place, you know, with Silicon Valley, other places. I mean, uh, that is how we did, you know, uh, blockchain technologies in our banks. So that's how we initiated, you know, machine learning. That's how we initiated artificial, you know, intelligence in our institution. How, that's how we initiated robotics uh, in our institution. So I, I, I find this, you know, very valuable. And at the end of the day, it is, it is our customers, the people who are benefiting from this. Uh, uh, better quality of service, better efficiency, less cost. We mentioned about this democratization. I, I, I, I fully endorse this, like, you know, uh, things like, you know, inclusion. So uh, everybody is, is, is actually, you know, uh, benefiting from. Uh, last but not least, I think I find this also, you know, 
very important. This COVID-19 uh, uh, experience that, that, that uh, we had, I think it is something very unprecedented. I, I, I've been in business for many years, but I, I've never seen you know, anything like this. So uh, of course we had to protect our own people, our customers. So as a result of this, uh, we had to uh, uh, reduce our branch hours. We also had to reduce our number of people serving our customers. So for quite a while, our branch capacity was reduced to roughly 25%. And when you look at the number of customers visiting our branches, it was one tenth of what we used to have before. But when you look at the bank's total number of transactions, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't believe this, but it was only down by only roughly 5%, 10% max. So, how could this happen? I mean, uh, I, I think the answer is very easy. Through all these, you know, technologies that we have been investing over the last, you know, so many decades. So our mobile banking was up. Bernard Hanum mentioned some figures from, you know, other, uh, other you know, uh, markets and uh, other institutions. S something very similar. So our mobile transactions were up like, you know, 20 to 30 percent. So uh, as you said, you know, our contactless transactions were almost twice as much, almost twice as much. Uh, like e-commerce transactions, it was like, you know, 25% of the total transactions, car card transactions uh, uh, in our system. So, uh, so the bank has been investing so much. So we had the infrastructure, but uh, this is this, this is not uh, alone uh, enough, but but the customer mindset was was also well, was also there. So we had lots of new you know mobile banking customers. So it, some of these customers who never uh, used those uh, those, those systems, you know, they had the courage to to to test it, and and so that it is so so easy, so so simple. So therefore, uh, I'm very happy with the results. So now, as you know, there is all th those you know discussions, new normal, and so on. I, I don't like this term very much. So it's not like really you know black and white. So all of a sudden we had this you know uh, unfortunate COVID-19 situation, and tomorrow we will have a complete you know totally complete complete new life. Uh, I, I I don't think that you know. Uh, uh, what we have been uh, going through will, will, will happen like this, but we will we will continue to evolve, and and and, and I think there will be further acceleration uh, in our uh, evolution. So uh, we had this vision anyhow in our bank, but with this COVID nineteen, things are accelerated so rapidly. I mean, if if if we are up to us. Maybe it would have probably taken uh, for another one or two years to come to that you know level of sophistication. So therefore, things will be moving you know faster. But I think you know work environment will be a little bit you know different than what we used to have. Banking habits, some of these you know existing banking habits, I, I think will remain there uh, for for for for uh, on a, on a permanent basis. Uh, so uh, it will be a new, you know, exciting, you know, environment, uh, challenges, uh, but, but excitement. So therefore, you know, this refreshing ourselves, new, uh, this design, this design focus, uh, simplicity, again, you know, customer centricity, uh, innovation, uh, you know, minds. I, I think the, these, these will be, uh, uh, becoming more and more important in the coming days. Thank you, Alcambe. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to address to the audience, uh, the young Turks, they're <laughs> going to ask questions. Yes. Uh, what Alcambe said, you know, in Turkish we say, her şerden bir hayır doğar. Every blame brings a blessing. Is it a good translation? I don't know. But Anyhow, this COVID 
was a blame. It's a curse of the, na of the yes. nature. But it created certain opportunities. It has been a great experiment so yes. that we can try something not really voluntarily, but we were obliged to, to try it. And now, now to the audience. Now, you are going to be either a saver, a household. You will save money. Or you will be an entrepreneur or a manager in a business. You will need money. Or you will be a government officer or a politician. You have to collect taxes. Now, how this financial technologies will bring opportunities to you as a person saver, as an entrepreneur, or as a governor, uh, government member. So this was just a suggestion to the audience. Demir Bey, I think uh, we gave enough food for thought to the audience. Now it's their turn to ask questions. Will sure, you manage that part? Uh, you have kindly requested me to do so yesterday. So if it's uh, if if you'd like me to do so, I can. Okay, go uh, ahead so, and uh, uh, make uh, the connection. Just, just to just a reminder to our audience: as the chat was turned off in our last panels, it has been open throughout the sole panel. But if you cannot see the chat, if you cannot. T uh, type in your question. If you could just uh, refresh your web page, you will be able to see the chat. So please do that. And uh, yes, we have had actually various questions throughout the forum, and I will try to evenly distribute the questions. Uh, my first question, well, not mine, the audience's first question that I've decided to ask primarily uh, is directed to Miss Berna Ullmann, and it it's, uh, it's an issue of personal significance to me. You probably could imagine what could have been asked uh, to you, but um, before moving on with the question, uh, well, the, the question is about the inclusion of more women in, in the financial institutions, in also in the uh, ex executive positions in around 12. But I'd like to mention before moving on to, to, to our next question, uh, that our last year's theme was financial inclusion and Bernanum was one of the speakers in, the, in our last year's forum as well. And her own panel uh, was titled Financial Inclusion, How Fintechs Help the Financial Inclusion of Women. So I believe that she uh, could reshare some of her experiences <laughs> as we have a wider uh, audience this year. You could maybe reshare some of the stuff that you kindly shared last year. And I'd also like to remind our um, aim for conducting this, uh, th this conference at this point, and also the, the aim that this club was established was to emphasize the positive contribution of financial technologies to the economic and social development of our country through their allowance for financial inclusion in the society as a whole. So yes, I just wanted to remind that. This question has been asked in various formats. I joined them together. It has been, I, I took the consent of the people asking them so I can share their names. It has been asked by our 12th grader, Pelin Çetin, and our 11th grader, they're both from Koç, Cenker Camcı. So uh, they're asking, how has been your experience as a woman in a male-dominated industry? And how do you hmm. think female representation can be improved in fields of business administration and economics? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So yes, Demir knows very well that this is this is a topic uh, very close to my heart. So uh, diversity is is is is an issue. Diversity uh, and inclusion is an issue in many industries. Uh, if anything, as far as I'm concerned, in finance in Turkey, we have a pretty uh, you know more balanced environment versus any of the other industries. And you know I. I I think, you know, when I compare finance to other industries, it's better. Turkey compared to other countries, it's better. But even then, it, it is not, you know, we're not where we where we need to be. So I would like to kind of, you know, combine this question with uh, fintechs because we're talking about fintechs and we did discuss this last year too. And uh, for me, this is very important. So 
e, fintechs entrepreneurs uh, is is the new is the new is the future right but when we look at them we see that most of the entrepreneurs are not are, are males you know uh, you know we we see very little uh, you know women led on uh, you know uh, fintechs just generally any startups anyway but including in fintechs too and what we see is investments uh, also not going to women-led entrepreneurs and having a bias. Investment is biased in, in the fintech uh, or just generally startup area. So, however, we, the stats tell us that uh, women uh, succeed, uh, women-led um, uh, you know, startups succeed twice uh, better uh, versus uh, versus uh, the average. I I think that's very important. So uh, conversations like this, you know, having an awareness about this, having an awareness awareness in the investment circles, and we're working a lot with Selim Bay and the team on on this subject to trying to make sure that there's an awareness that any any company who who is active in the space, who maybe comes up with cohorts, who come, you know, kind of comes up with, uh, you know, different programs, is conscious and makes a very intentional effort to, to make a more, uh, more balanced environment is important. Why is it important? You know, not only because it's the right thing to do, you know, ethically, but also business-wise, it's the right thing to do. Uh, and for that, you know, 50% of our consumers are women, right? But if our, you know, our startups are led by men, how are we going to really, uh, you know, come up with consumer experiences that are geared toward the needs of the 50% of the population? So, yeah, I think conversations like this help a lot. And uh, I, I, am, I am hopeful, you know, a, a lot of good stuff is happening in this space. So thank you for asking the question, Demir. You're welcome. It's, can, can, I, can, I, can I interfere yes, a please. little in yes, this? Please. Because this is a very important subject for us as well. I mean, for, for women, actually, finance sector uh, can be a, a, a very, you know, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, sector with a lot of you know future I and mean, I, I just just to give you some figures from our own institution but it is more or less the same across the industry it's like you know 55 percent women in our institution and when you look at the executive level this is something that i'm very proud of 40 percent of my my deputies so that number is increasing almost every year 40 percent it's not it's not only at you know lower levels but at the very senior level, executive level, 40% uh, uh, of the deputies are actually, you know, women today. So I'm, I'm really proud to say that. Uh, so th this can happen in Turkey too. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for, for your comments, Mr. Dinbashkid. Uh, I also wanted to start with this question as it was aligned with our, uh, with our overall purpose. But uh, the next question will be directed towards Mr. Dinbashkid. And uh, it's actually a special question because it's from one of uh, our youngest viewers today. We have, other than all Turkish high schools, we have only shared the YouTube links uh, from middle school to our eighth graders. And uh, the eighth grader president in our own coach, uh, coach middle school, the president of the student council, Emir Pakish, has delivered uh, a message to you and has, has, is asking a question to you in the name of all eighth graders who are currently watching. So the question is about education and what uh, steps they could take in their educations to, to become pioneers like yourself in the fields of economics and finance. It's rather about an educational decision, I could say. So he's asking, should we study economics or do we have to study economics in college for a bachelor's degree? and specialize in this area from beginning? Or uh, can we also study an area in a different social science and then have a master's degree in business administration? What would be the best way to follow? He's asking for your uh, considerable advice. So what, what I would suggest for Emir and, and the other you know, uh, young friends, uh, I, I, like in, you know, uh, men and women, 
I, I'm a strong believer in uh, diversity and diversity in the education as well. So if you look at the bank today, so uh, th there are people with different backgrounds. Uh, th there's a big, you know, technology department. There's a big, you know, innovation department. There are some, you know, very serious, you know, uh, mathematically oriented people, you know, in lending, analytics, other areas, you know, internal uh, systems and so on. So what I'm trying to say, so we have like, you know, 12 and a half, th half thousand people and the diversity, I, I, I guess, is, is, is uh, very critical. So we have been actually changing our uh, uh, uh, we don't call it as you know human resources anymore. I, we we call it like uh, in some culture, which is you know people and people and talent, and we have been trying to apply this multidisciplinary uh, approach in our institution. So you, you can be working in a branch, but we we don't want to you know stay your li whole life in a branch, and we try to rotate you if you are in landing. We, we try to. Uh, give you a job in another department and so on. So I believe that uh, for executive you know, positions, uh, this, this is the best way of actually uh, helping our people. So I think this is also true uh, for the education. So at the end of the day, uh, your leadership skills, uh, I, I think we would play a, a critical role uh, you should be a very open-minded. So if, if, if you start with a certain subject, I, sh I think you should be flexible enough to switch another thing. So you, you should be, because the world is changing. So to the, today I can give you a definition. So AKB <laughs> asked me a very valid question. So he asked me whether we will exist, you know, 100 years, 50 years down the road. So, I mean, it, it's, it's very difficult to, to imagine, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years later. So. I think this, you know, learning skills very uh, important. Adaptability is, is, I guess, is very important. Multidisciplinary skills would be very important. So I, I don't have a, just one single recipe, to, to be frank with you. So Demir, can I make a comment on this yes, one? Yes, yes, please. So uh, since I'm uh, teaching at the university, uh, I always ask my students uh, what would they like to be uh, after they uh, graduated. Uh, for the last uh, 10 years, uh, I didn't even hear them to be uh, working at a bank. So uh, rather, uh, they want to choose to be a, an entrepreneur, or they want to work with, uh, with an entrepreneur, uh, disrupting the uh, whole system. I mean, uh, the whole financial system, the whole uh, manufacturing system, whatever. whatever. Because uh, entrepreneurial mind is uh, very different than the corporate mind. Uh, you, have, uh, you have to think uh, very differently. Uh, how to hack the system. Uh, I mean, hacking uh, by hacking uh, to create uh, a better one. So um, uh, you are already close to technology. Your, your age is very close to technology. Uh, I mean, uh, I can call you as the digital born ones. Uh, so um, as Professor Inan mentioned earlier in the uh, panel, uh, try to be, you, you have to be curious uh, and be a challenger as well. Um, you should forget the boundaries, the boundaries uh, that uh, I, I've been uh, trained as an engineer, uh, but uh, on my ages, uh, on the training, uh, on the uh, education side, uh, most of my um, friends were uh, chosen by the banks. Uh, I, I was talking about uh, the beginning of the 90s. Uh, as the MTs, uh, most of the uh, C level uh, of the banks are today uh, engineers. So uh, business students uh, do not want to uh, take a part on the banks, but rather uh, I uh, I um, want you to c concentrate on the data to, to understand the data. Uh, maybe a data scientist uh, structure or. Uh, uh, mindset is uh, very important. You should understand artificial intelligence because um, data science and artificial intelligence are very um, cross boundaries, cross uh, industrial uh, 
educations. So uh, they are reliable in any industry. So uh, if I were you, uh, I would like to choose uh, right now with my, uh, at this year's uh, experience, uh, I would choose to study data science or become a data scientist. And so you can either work for a bank or, or work for a card scheme or work for uh, any industry. So this is uh, an independent uh, life. That is true, uh, very, very important subject. But what I would suggest, maybe a general uh, recommendation for my friends, be, be very good in whatever you do. Yes. Uh, shine, shine in what, whatever you do, okay? And, and also be ready for a change, be curious. So I think that would be necessary if, if you really would like to climb up the ladder, whether you are an entrepreneur, whether you work in a bank, in another company, I think that these are very critical looking forward. Thank you. I think our uh, young viewers also will get a lot of, uh, will get a lot from this in, uh, as there, as we are at the age of choosing uh, our bachelor's degree or choosing our majors when moving on to university, you know, uh, at, at, to some people that who may not know here, in so, uh, between our viewers, uh, well, some one applying to U.S. universities and starting there, you don't actually commit to a major uh, until the sometimes even until the end or middle of the second year. So we still have quite a lot of time. Lots of us are going abroad to study. So uh, lots of people have a lot of time to to choose their chosen degrees, and I think they will take your advice into account while choosing which courses they can take. So moving on from data science, another uh, subject or sort of sub uh, theme that is currently being debated is currently a rising field is artificial intelligence. And we have had a few questions directed to Professor Yozaja about the, the use of artificial intelligence in finance. Uh, it, they've been asked by Ata Zavaro and Kutai Gökgöz, our viewers. So they're asking, uh, how do you think AI will change the behavioral finance field uh, from different perspectives? Could you please comment on that? Sure. Uh, <laughs> it will change everything because uh, artificial intelligence is uh, the way uh, that all the industries will depend because uh, with artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, you have the capacity to uh, analyze big data, um, which needs some uh, data culture. I call it as a data culture. Um, with artificial intelligence, uh, I can give you some examples. Uh, let's say financial advisory. Uh, financial advisory is very important for the financial institution, uh, in institutions because they are uh, major job is uh, uh, almost advising. Uh, if you have any uh, artificial intelligent uh, uh, mechanism on your, let's say, uh, phone, uh, cellular phone, uh, then it will track your behavior, the financial behavior on, and your risk behavior. And uh, at some certain point, uh, it will comment on your uh, decisions. Uh, and give you some suggestions. Try this one and try this one. If you are happy with the choices of the uh, uh, machine, uh, then you will uh, ask um, it to continue uh, without asking you uh, any permission because uh, it will detect your uh, risk assessment uh, and uh, your decisions uh, with the data uh, on the long side, on the long side of the uh, data, uh, I mean, uh, if this uh, decision uh, maker uh, will uh, stay on your phone, let's say for five months, and if you are a regular investor uh, in the uh, financial area, then it will calculate the risks that uh, you can uh, take. Uh, this is one example. Uh, another example is from uh, insurance industry. Uh, it will also uh, change the mechanism of the uh, insurance industry. Uh, we will have some uh, intelligent automation systems. 
uh, we have artificial intelligence uh, at the uh, systems of the banks uh, or uh, other financial institutions uh, because they are delivering some uh, high-end uh, mechanisms like uh, auditing, like uh, compliance. Uh, they are working on the uh, back uh, systems so they can uh, track if uh, any of those um, processes are uh, anti-money uh, laundering if they uh, concern any fraud and they report it to you and they are uh, working seven days uh, and 24 hours without asking uh, any uh, any uh, more uh, money from you uh, or without asking uh, any permissions to leave uh, in the system. So, um, it will change everything, I think. Uh, there are some uh, good examples. Or let's say on the credit uh, decision uh, side, uh, it can uh, make a credit score. It can calculate your credit score uh, depending on your, uh, let's say, payments. Let's say your uh, risk taking. So uh, this will change many of the uh, institutions as well. Yes. Uh, about 95% of transactions take place outside the branch environment, 95%. About 80% of our new consumer loans are given on a, uh, on a digital platform. So uh, just to support your uh, uh, Professor Yazici's point, yeah. uh, you can imagine the extent of need for, for uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all those, you know, technological you know uh, enhancements and also the chatbots chatbots yes there's a tremendous amount of work you know, a tremendous amount of investments yeah. that we have been doing insights insights to our customers yeah so major many of our customers we, we don't see them anymore so how do you provide a, a, a personalized service to somebody you never see I mean that, that that's a big sure. challenge. I, That's I, a very big if, challenge. If I may add, the perspective of finance is uh, ecosystem has a lot of data, a lot of big data. But you know, AI. I mean, we need to really, really uh, do much more and to turn it into consumer-friendly experiences. Uh, so I think. Yes, a lot is being done already, you know, fraud, AML, you know, all of that, but uh, scoring, etc. but a lot still needs to be done. Uh, I think the critical thing is, how can you make this technology human? So yes. I, I think this, this human side, so this is, we have certain design principles. I, I, I tried to mention some of these, but this human centricity, you know, yeah. I, I think I think that this this is yeah. the heart of it. Yeah. Keep it simple, uh, you know, uh, innovative and so on. But but this human element, yeah, your your own people as well as your customers. I think this is the key. Yeah. Emir Bey, yes, zamanımız yes. doldu mu? Evet. Farkındayım. <laughs> Sonuna yaklaşıyoruz. As we are <laughs> approaching the end, uh, we have had many questions. If if you'd like, you can uh, share. Uh, if you'd like me to do so, I can address these questions to the uh, internal communications departments of your uh, companies, so that maybe someone from your company will be able to turn to answer all the questions that hasn't been able. If if you'd like me to do so, someone uh, from your departments could uh, contact me, and I can happily send sure. all the questions. Uh, but before ending, I've got a, a question to all of you from our eighth grade dean at our school. I think it would be a, a nice way to end this panel. So I'll be asking that. It's, it's not directed towards a particular person, but it's, it's open so any of you could answer. Uh, she's asking to, to study economics or to, to uh, become a pioneer in these fields. What other competencies should one possess? other than sufficient academic and area specific knowledge. So I'll, I'll kick off. I, I liked uh, the reference to learning, uh, you know, learning culture and constant learning, continuous learning, because, you know, 
life will continue to change. The context, the challenges, the uh, opportunities will continue to change unless you are adapting yourself, unless you understand and you learn and be curious and be, go with that. Uh, then uh, you know that then you know that's that's so critical to your success i would like to if i were to pull one thing i would say learning culture and then the other one would be resilience resilience you will you will fail if if you are going to uh, you know achieve something you will fail what will what will set you apart is how you bounce back whether you bounce back if you bounce back and your resilience will determine your success so learning resilience very good. If, if uh, any of our panelists has anything to add, they, you're welcome. Yes, I have. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, for me, uh, is, uh, challenging everything is very important. So uh, do not uh, do not afraid to challenge anything. Uh, but you have the uh, knowledge to challenge uh, anything. If you don't have uh, any knowledge, uh, then uh, you're lost. Uh, and uh, do not afraid to make um, uh, a mistake unless uh, you learn from them. Okay, that's very important. I mean, I, I totally agree with all the uh, suggestion, suggestions. Being open-minded, continuous learning, curiosity, Things are changing all the time, so you have to refresh yourself and uh, never get scared to fail and, and challenge. I, I agree. So. Thank you very much for all your answers. I'd like to now yield the floor for one last time to our um, middle school uh, principal, the director of our coach middle school, so that she can uh, thank each and every one of you for your participation. Yes, Meltem Hocam, please. Thank you, Demir. Uh, hello everyone, uh, this panel has been very inspiring for both our students and faculty and for me. Uh, we would like to thank to our esteemed guest speakers, uh, Mr. Ege Jansen, uh, Mr. Hakan Bin Başkil, uh, Mrs. Berna Ulman, uh, and Professor Dr. Sel Selim Yazıcı. And I would also like to express my gratitude to Demir Timuray, Khan Karakash, and all those students for organizing this activity and inviting us. Uh, and I want to add a very tiny thing, which is the explanation made by Berna Hanım and the comment made by Hakan Bey about women colleagues is very valuable for me, uh, for us too, uh, as we are as educators, you know, uh, trying to shape young people's future in this country. So thanks a lot. That was very meaningful to me. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Uh, thank, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting. Thank you. I'll close off the forum with some closing remarks. Uh, if our panelists uh, want to, they're welcome to stay. But the, this session has ended, so I'll just deliver some closing uh, remarks on the on the forum as a whole. Uh, <laughs> to, I'll I'll just start by summarizing some some concepts that have been introduced by all our different all various um, various speakers so Hüsnü Bey was the first speaker of this year's forum he has stated that students who are interested in sectors such as fintech which got over 150 billion dollars worth of investments in the last 10 years are on the right path for success uh, he's further emphasized the importance of digital transformation and said that it was the key when it comes to growth and traditional banks uh, are, were renovating in order to become more successful. Uh, the discussion was followed up by our first, uh, first panel, Fast Forwarding Digital Transformation, attended by Koç University's President uh, Umran Hoca, uh, Vodafone Turkey CEO Coleman Deegan and Hepsi Burada uh, CEO Murat Emirda. Uh, Umran Hoca has stated that education is a face-to-face -face experience, but due to the coronavirus crisis, technology will have to be, will inimitably uh, have to be incorporated into it. Mr. Deegan has stated that due to the coronavirus, the importance and effect of technological communications 
are even more than it used to be. And the technology in the life of business will increase the efficiency of business meetings and daily tasks. Uh, Murat Bey has stated that important preventions are being held in this process and the online shopping industry is shaping accordingly. A lot of people were immersing themselves in the digital world during these times. And he believes that this will have a permanent effect on the perception of the digital world. And on our last session uh, of the day, we have hosted the panelists, in which you can still see on your screens. The, the, the panel was entitled uh, Reimagining the Opportunities of Financial Technologies. Uh, Professor Yazıcı has stated that through personal solutions and financial inclusion, fintechs are reconstructing and dem democratizing financial services. And furthermore, with the use of AI and data, in-depth and accurate solutions could be formed for customers. Uh, Berna Hanım has stated that due to the coronavirus, old payment methods such as the use of cash and credit card uh, used with a PIN has changed into contactless and more mobile payment methods. Uh, after the coronavirus, these payment methods would be expected to become even more complex and more sterilized. And finally, Mr. Bimbashkil has stated that although banks will still remain existent, their way of conduction will change, in, uh, will change to accelerate banking procedures uh, and losing customers would become likely at this point. Banking uh, has evolved greatly since the beginning of the virus and is still continuing to evolve in ways in which, uh, which would include innovations and financial technologies. Customers benefit from the kinds of, uh, he has also stated that customers benefit from these kinds of technological advancements. So having said that, I'd like to thank all, all our guests, even though only a few of them can be here right now, all our guests who have delivered uh, their contributions to, to, to our forum. All our guests are pioneers in their respective fields. They're all respected figures that are known uh, by everyone who is interested in economics and finance. And I'm proud to say that uh, we have had, we have, almost never had less than 250 participants watching today. During Hüsnü Bey's speech, uh, the maximum participants we had was around 500. And I can safely uh, say that uh, some of these participants watching uh, are not even interested in studying anything related to these at college. Many of us are going to be studying abroad next year in, in the US, in the UK, or, uh, or through Europe. And uh, even though some of them will be choosing their respected majors later on, some of us have applied with a major. And we have had lots of guests, lots of viewers who, who were going to study some, uh, something related to biology, something related to, to physics, and we're still there to, to watch, to listen to, the, to, to, your, to your valuable contributions. And before ending the forum, I'd, uh, I prepared a surprise. It was a surprise for them as well. I, I, I, we have three other organizers other than Khan and myself. They're, they're the younger generation. They're 10th and 11th graders. I would like to kindly ask them to turn their cameras on at the moment, if you could. Ayşegül, Melis, and Matt, please. Khan as well, please. Uh, <laughs> so I, I wanted at the end of the forum for everyone to see their lovely faces, because this uh, forum, this whole thing could not have been possible without their help. Uh, we started this club two years ago, uh, three years ago, I'm sorry, uh, with, with two of my friends who, who were one year senior to me. And they're, they're now uh, in two different, two, two very, very well respected universities in the US. They are watching us and they are proud. They're in the viewers uh, section right now. And that is exactly what I'm going to do in the years to come. Uh, to, to all viewers who may not know, me, myself and Khan are graduating this year from, from the Koch High School. Uh, I will be going to, to the UK to, to pursue a degree in social and public policy with politics. And Khan uh, will be pursue her, his studies uh, in in New York in the United States, and I, I he he he will deliver a short uh, remarks. He, he can say uh, what he's planning to concentrate or major on. But these uh, people, Aishegül, Melis, and Matt, they are our next generation, 
and uh, I, I can also say that I could only invite a few of them. They, they are the ones who we are going to transfer the club to. But in the background of these activities, we have had about 12 or 13 of our club members actively participating in discussions, actively participating on how to make this forum become a thing. We have had a wise distribution of role. Everybody uh, was so perfect in their assigned roles. And uh, our club is compromised of 45 people. 13 people are in the core organization team. And Ayşe Gül and Melis are 11th graders whom I'll be, uh, <laughs> I'll be yielding the, the club and, and the, this forum next year, hopefully at a time in which they can deliver it uh, in, in person at, at the school. So <laughs> I, I just wanted to show their faces to everyone who's watching so that they could know that I could not have done this by myself, that I had all these lovely people helping me organize this amazing uh, experience. And I am proud to see them here and I am sure that I'll be proud watching them next year as a, as a viewer this time, hopefully at the time in which I can uh, <laughs> come to the school. Khan, would you like to say a few words as well? Oh, yes, please. Uh, Demir, if you could open my uh, cam, uh, because okay. I, I have... Uh, yes, yeah, it should work now. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to all of our guests who participated in this forum. Uh, Demir and I was planning to do this forum in person at Kot School. We were hoping to do it, but after the coronavirus, the situation got uh, worse and we were contacted by Elif Kara Öztürk, our uh, principal, and she she offered us to do this uh, lovely forum uh, in online. And as our project is uh, based on technology as well, and the technology we have to use all of our opportunities that we have, so we decided to uh, conduct this forum uh, online and. I'm uh, very grateful of, uh, for Elif teacher uh, for uh, offering this thing because without her, we weren't uh, going to do this forum. And all of our participants, uh, thank you very much. And as a student, as an aspiring student going to college, all of your uh, ideas uh, has made a, a remark in my brain and probably uh, shaped my uh, ideas and, and projects that I will be doing in university. And I'm planning to uh, study economics and computer science at New York University. And uh, hopefully uh, I'm uh, planning to uh, join the workforce in, in industry of finance uh, or technology, some way uh, joining to the new innovations and FinTech uh, innovations in the global. Uh, so, and all of our uh, friends, uh, we, we FinTech uh, club is consisting of more than 50 people, but uh, our uh, project was a group project and uh, there were uh, lots of uh, friends who helped in all of the aspects of this forum, like social media wise and the technical wise. Yeah. So, and and so all of our uh, friends, uh, we, we FinTech uh, club. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't so stop I would like to thank Sorry. <laughs> and for our, our group friends and thank you all of you guys as well and yeah. see you next year. Elif Hoca, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I couldn't stop myself. Sorry, I just interrupted you. But it was a, like a pleasure for me to hear that because when this coronavirus started, I was thinking of that. I know that you have put a lot of effort to these events to make this happen. I remember that when you visit me with Melis, Ayşe Gül and Mert, um, they were all willing to do this. And after this pandemic situation, we were not able to. When I emailed you and after like a two weeks I didn't hear from you I was actually um, feeling um, um, bad about it not hearing anything but then you wrote that you were all planning together to make this happen so I am very proud of you I also want to mention John Sevinding, John Jonga as well my esteemed uh, alumni students who actually started this journey with you Demir and Khan uh, without their contribution, it was not possible uh, 
uh, to have this conference happening last year. As you remember, it was a rush time again last year, trying to organize this in like almost in two weeks. And thanks to our panelists again, as uh, Meltem Ojam, thank to them. I'm very proud of you. Uh, and I'm, I'm very thankful to them as well uh, uh, to attend the conference and make this very valuable for all of us. Okay, then thank you for the intro, uh, in, uh, invitation. So uh, let's keep in touch uh, and see you uh, maybe next year. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Bye -bye. thank you. And congratulations once again. Stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Hello. Evet.